Hello, everybody. It is so great to have you on this trauma workshop again. I'm going to pull my slides up in the background here. We are really excited about this panel. Let's see. Just take me one second, if you will. Okay. There we go. Okay. So hello, everybody. It is um, just wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much. We are so excited about the response we've had to the series of workshops. Now we're on our sixth, and we have a very exciting group of panelists today. Um, so I'm presenting you to you, the Building a National Movement to Prevent Trauma and, and Foster Resilience. And just want to remind you that uh, something that all of you know is that as a community, a series of communities, we have a choice in, in everything that goes on, everything that we're exposed to, um, everything that we do. And so it is a community choice to make a change and ensure that we are reducing trauma and, and fostering resilience in our children, our families, in our, in our communities. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. This happens to me every time. Okay, there we go. So um, just a reminder that the Campaign for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice the PACES Connection and the National Prevention Science Coalition to Improve Lives, which I represent, is sponsoring, hosting this series of workshops. My name is Dr. Diana Fishbein, um, call me Denny, and I'm at the University of North Carolina Child, uh, Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute uh, in Chapel Hill. I also have a part-time position at Penn State University, and I'm the founder and co-director of the MPSC. These are our sponsors. I wanna give a shout out to all the organizations that are sponsoring this series of workshops. If you take a quick look, you'll see who they are. And then to introduce our sixth workshop, building the movement with foundations. So I'm just gonna give you some housekeeping tips. Um, Jesse Kohler, the uh, executive director of CTIP will provide opening remarks. And then we have the Scattergood Foundation, the United Way of Greater Philadelphia and Southern New Jersey. Then we have the Oregon Research Institute and Values to Action. And we have Dogwood Health Trust. And then the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation will speak, then Kentucky Bounce Initiative. And then we have a Share Your Story with Natasha, Natasha Gines. So, a few housekeeping tips. Oh, sorry, next workshops. I do wanna make uh, a change to our original agenda. We have decided to add a building the movement by activating and equipping community coalitions to our list of workshops. So that will be next on April 1st from one to four uh, Eastern time. And what we're going to do here is really talk about how to approach different sectors and systems within the community so that we can really provide the tools from experts in these sectors about how to really engage with these sectors to embed trauma-informed practices into their systems. So that's gonna be a how-to kind of session. And then after that, we will have building the movement to address trauma extending from climate change and environmental justice. And then finally, building the movement through policy and advocacy. A few housekeeping tips. An uh, important update is that we will provide certificates of attendance for those that are here live um, or that participate fully. Um, and so we will be contacting those of you to that are here in the here and now to provide those cert certificates. Um, also, as you already know, feel free to engage in the chat. Um, it gets, it's very busy. The chat is very busy, so it's difficult for us to track it in, in real time, but we do organize the chat so that we can identify important comments and resources and links and websites. Um, and we will provide them um, eventually on our resource site as we are able to organize the chat. The best way to interact with the speaker is through the Q&A. So please do submit your questions only to the Q&A 
Jesse Kohler and I will track that and we will give a shout out to the speakers so that they can respond to them either in writing or uh, in their talking points. Um, store the invitation link that you have now if in a safe place because it's the same one that we use every time. Also, please expect an email asking you to fill out a very brief survey so that we can evaluate ourselves. And uh, there's a breakout session after the panel that Jesse will provide a link to. And if you don't get it, if it doesn't, um, you know, if the session closes before you've written down the link, uh, you can find it on our websites. So you can look there. Our website, MPSC, is at the bottom of this slide here. Um, and then finally, all the recordings, the handouts, the PowerPoints, the websites and other resources will appear on our website after a few days after each uh, workshop. So please do check that often. Okay, so now I'm gonna introduce Jesse Kohler, the Executive Director of CTIP. Thanks, Denny. And for folks, I just put the breakout room info in the chat early. I will put it in again later, so don't worry too much about getting it. And like Denny said, it is in the, um, I want to make sure that I'm sharing my screen. Forgot to press share my screen. Apologies there. Uh, I will share it again later, and it is also on the NPSC website. Uh, we are already a little bit over time, and so I will keep my remarks about CTIP very brief, but it has been an exciting opportunity for the Campaign for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice to partner with the National Prevention Science Coalition to improve lives, PACE's Connection, and so many other organizations, as well as all of you on the line in putting this workshop series together. Really what CTIP is focused on is supporting communities for a healthier, more just, and resilient society. We do this by shaping policy, empowering advocates, and amplifying community voices. Your input in the work that we do is so important. As we work to move mountains and create social reform over the long haul of time, we need a groundswell of support. And all of you, the coalitions that you're a part of, you as individuals play a role both in terms of your feedback through a democratic process of what you see as needs, as well as your participation through outreach to elected officials, other key stakeholders, and more people in your own network to create that groundswell of support. So we wanna help create conditions that empower all of you to feel like you have a role in the movement and also amplify those voices so that it is community led while oftentimes we hold up microphones in the speeches that we give, I'd like to say that we also want to hold up a megaphone so that all of you feel like your voice is important in this movement as well, because it truly, truly is. Our approach is to build relationships across all levels of government, across all sectors, as I think has been illustrated throughout this workshop series. We like to foster dialogue and we'll continue to deepen ways so that way we can engage further with you beyond the CTIP CAN calls and just the breakout rooms after these calls. We continue to try to invest more in opportunities to hear from you, learn from you, and from you all to learn from each other. And that will continue to become more apparent moving forward. We seek strategic opportunities for growth, both on the policy side and the practice side. And we drive racial and social justice. Social justice is key to the trauma-informed resilience focus and healing-centered movement. We cannot be a trauma-informed society if we are discriminating against and marginalizing others. And it takes all of us to make this happen. We have big dreams, but we need for all of you to be a part of that movement and to invite others both through the education, the advocacy, the networking, and other opportunities as we continue to expand this movement across the country and hopefully someday also around the world. I know that we have some international folks on the calls with us here. So together, we partner with communities, we uplift and amplify voices, we provide the ability to heal and grow in communities, we inform policies that create necessary funding, build trauma-informed and healing-centered systems, create sustainable and cost-saving impacts, reinvest in communities to further prevention, and prioritize good health and well-being for all. What we ask for all of you to do is to join the National Trauma Campaign. Also, as we've been promoting on these calls, there will be opportunities as coalitions to join press on as well as we build out that coalition voice 
And I invite anybody to reach out to me at my CTIP address. You can find the websites for CTIP and the trauma campaign there. We are currently redoing our website. So there will be more available soon. The last thing that I will say very, very quickly is just how grateful I am to get to be in this position. And again, it is really a function of getting to work with all of you uh, in whatever capacity you hold to be able to also promote this work. And so CTIP wants to engage with you. Please reach out if you have any ideas, want to discuss. We want to help build coalitions. We want to help foster and empower advocates. And it's going to take all of us to reach our big, big dreams of creating a trauma-informed, resilience-focused and healing-centered society for all. Try to keep that as short as possible. Hope that I did a decent job doing so. But we have some tremendous panelists with us today. So to start, um, Denny will be doing most of the introductions, but I will very quickly kick it over to Caitlin O'Brien from the Scatter Good Foundation to talk about the Trauma-Informed Philanthropy Guide. So uh, Caitlin, please. Thank you so much, Jesse. I'm going to share my screen here. All right. Let me see. Real quick. Okay. Um, so thank you all so much for having me. It's really nice to be here um, and to, you know, be with you all in this amazing workshop series. Um, my name is Caitlin O'Brien and I'm the Director of Learning and Community Impact at the Scattergood Foundation in Philadelphia. Um, at the Scattergood Foundation, we think, do, and support in order to shift the paradigm and practice for behavioral health and recognize the unique spark and basic dignity in every human. Um, so before I dive in, I'd really like to start by thanking uh, CTIP and Pieces Connection and the National Prevention Science Coalition to Improve Lives for pulling this amazing workshop series together. Um, I think we can all agree that the events of the last two years between COVID-19, um, the movement for racial justice, the 2020 election, the now war in Ukraine, and so many other challenging events, uh, these conversations like this are even more critical than they ever have been. And I think there is some incredible movement towards all of us working together to really build a stronger future. So, um, you know, as has been discussed through the series and will continue to be discussed through the series, building a movement for trauma-informed care really requires an all-hands-on-deck approach and every sector playing a role. Um, and what I and so many of the other presenters who are joining today uh, are here to discuss is really what is the role that funders can play in preventing trauma and promoting healing and resilience. Um, funders really are a critical resource for the nonprofit organizations that are providing services across communities. And in that way, we're in a unique position with access to capital and resources um, that can really catalyze innovative approaches to make change. So, you know, when it comes down to it, there are, there are like really very few restrictions on how philanthropy can use its dollars. And it gives us tremendous flexibility and opportunity. Um, so our challenge to funders is really like, how do we use that opportunity to address adversity and trauma and, you know, knowing that that is the underlying cause of so many of the outcomes that philanthropy is ultimately trying to change. Um, so, you know, what we know is that whether we know it or not, all funders are doing work that impacts individuals who've experienced trauma. And that our goal with the guide is to make sure that funders can be more effective in how they address the issue. And this is coming directly from the president of the Scattergood Foundation, Joe Pyle. Um, and I think just to expand is that what we all know here is that trauma is so prevalent and uh, ultimately impacts everyone because of its prevalence, um, either directly or through its ripple effects. So, we know that through programming, um, we can sort of either choose to ignore that fact or we can and like label people who are exhibiting symptoms of having experiencing trauma as 
problematic, uh, or we can do the work to address the causes of those symptoms and um, prevent trauma from happening in the first place. So, um, you know, we, we have developed uh, a series of two guides and a companion infographic uh, about trauma-informed philanthropy and the role that funders have in building the movement of trauma-informed practice. But before we get into sort of all of the nitty gritty details of all of that, I'd like to share a little bit about the story of like what, what got us to the place of um, writing these guides. Uh, so about six years ago, um, funders in the greater Philadelphia region really started asking more questions about trauma-informed practice. And they had been hearing from their um, program, their grantees that, um, you know, they were wanting trauma training and that they were really seeing the impacts of trauma in their communities that they were working with. And as a behavioral health funder that had invested in trauma-informed care, many of the funders were coming to us to learn more about trauma-informed practice, what all this was, um, and especially for folks who weren't in the health or behavioral health space, they were maybe having trouble connecting uh, ACEs and trauma to the work that they were doing. Um, and at the same time, as a significant funder of trauma training in the region, the United Way of Greater Philadelphia and Southern New Jersey, uh, they were also getting a lot of requests from funder peers to learn more about trauma. Um, and as a, a bonus today, you'll get to hear from our partners there and from Suzanne about more about their work in that space. Um, and so, you know, we came together with our uh, local regional association of grant makers, the Philanthropy Network of Greater Philadelphia, and we hosted a session on trauma, adverse childhood experiences, and talked a little bit about how um, the what the role of funders was in advancing the trauma informed movement. And, um, you know, one of the things that I really remember from that conversation was that. Uh, I think a lot of folks were thinking like, okay, we have to add a, a new sort of uh, portfolio of funding to address this trauma problem. And really what the message was there was like, this is a lens through which we can see all of our work and that um, we don't have to change our strategic plans or uh, do anything of that nature, have a big overhaul of, of all of our grant making, but really um, let's sort of add a layer onto our existing portfolios and use a trauma-informed approach to all of the work. Um, and, you know, it was a really well-attended session. And, um, you know, back when we had these like big uh, event sessions um, and after the fact, funders were still really excited to learn more. And so we decided to write it all down. And that uh, really led to the first volume of the Trauma-Informed Philanthropy Guide, which of course led to more questions. And um, sort of, I think a lot of funders were looking for very specific, like, what do I specifically do to be trauma-informed, to fund trauma-informed grants? What exactly do I need to be looking for? They were looking for, many folks were looking for sort of the checklist of um, funding trauma-informed organizations. Um, and we really were wanting to get funders to really engage with the principles of trauma-informed care and uh, really think deeply about what that all means and think about the process as much as the outcome. Um, and so that is something that we really tried to focus on more in the second volume of Trauma-Informed Philanthropy. Um, and, you know, we're working closely with the Health Federation of Philadelphia and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, to really think about uh, cross-sector networks and how philanthropy can play a critical role in those cross-sector networks, which then led to um, a companion infographic that I'll, I'll um, share with you all today. Um, and, you know, that has led to a, a partnership with the eExtension Foundation and some work with the Cooperative Extension System and how they can, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, take a trauma-informed approach to their work. So all of this has really kind of unfolded organically over time. So a 
across the guides, we focus on three core areas. Um, the first of which being understanding ACEs and trauma science, um, applying trauma-informed principles to grant making, and then leveraging resources and relationships. So in the first guide, we really start with a basic overview of ACEs and trauma science, which I'm not gonna go over today because I am assuming that I'm talking to the converted here. Um, and, but I do wanna talk a little bit about sort of what we want funders to understand. So first we want them to understand the basics of ACEs and trauma science and really how prevalent ACEs and trauma are and the impact that it has on the life course. Um, and I think really sort of um, that this is particularly important for helping funders who uh, don't work in the health or behavioral health space um, and to connect the dots between ACEs and trauma and their work. Um, we also talk about sort of different types of stress and the mechanisms through which um, traumatic events can bring about challenging health and social outcomes. Um, and then we also talk about solutions and what trauma-informed care and what resilience and uh, protective factors and how funders can, the, the programs that they fund can really uh, prevent and mitigate the impact of trauma. So in the second sort of area of, of the guides is that um, is how to apply the trauma-informed principles to grant making. Um, and this is, we try to emphasize that this is not only in what you fund, but also how you are uh, funding and sort of the, the practice of grant making. So of course we start with the six principles of trauma-informed practice and um, try to provide some examples of how you can, of how organizations can exemplify uh, that they are practicing each of these principles. Um, one of the things that we really try to emphasize here is that um, these principles are a helpful framework and that um, again, trying to not, have funders use this sort of checklist approach, but um, that this is these principles can be um, operationalized in so many different ways, uh, depending on the program, its strengths, the community, all of that, um, and to really sort of be flexible in our thinking about how these principles are operationalized. So in the second guide, we also highlight SAMHSA's 10 implementation domains and uh, look at case studies from organizations that have done a lot of work um, and sort of pull out some specific domains um, in each of these case studies. Um, and really wanting to show that uh, we have to be operationalizing these principles throughout sort of all the aspects of an organization and um, that it's not really sort of like just about having a referral process to um, a therapist who practices like TFCBT, but that uh, we really wanna be building a deep trauma-informed infrastructure. And in doing those case studies, uh, really three cross-cutting domains um, stood out. So the first was leadership and building leadership at all levels of the organization. So um, yes, of course, you wanna build buy-in um, of the executive leadership of an organization um, to approach a trauma for, or to use a trauma-informed approach, but also how are you working with um, folks really at all levels um, within an organization or a service provider to um, be empowered to be practicing those trauma-informed principles. Um, the second was culture change, and I think that you know really goes in keeping with that this leadership cross-cutting domain that we're shifting the paradigm within an organization, and um, we have to sort of reorganize how the work is done, and that it is we also have to be doing continual knowledge building, and that you know we all know that the science of uh, ACEs and trauma is sort of always changing. It, I mean, not changing its growing and building on itself and that we're learning new things all the time about um, 
approaches that work and um, trauma-informed practices and how and why they work to um, prevent and mitigate the impact of trauma. So in the development of the first guide, we were also fearful that um, by encouraging funders to sort of screen for trauma-informed programs or, you know, sort of saying like, this is what you should be looking for, um, that there might be a punitive approach that could be taken um, and that organizations that weren't fully realized in their trauma-informed journey would, you know, not get a grant because, because of that. And so um, we drew upon the, the Missouri model um, to say like, this is really about um, how do we get organizations to move along the spectrum um, and that, you know, funders should take the opportunity to work with their green teas to move along the spectrum. Um, and so it's not about just looking for what are the organizations that are already there and investing in them, but saying, okay, how do I work with this grantee who um, is still maybe struggling on the, the internal policies side and they need some, some work to move toward, um, you know, being fully trauma-informed and also recognizing that, um, you know, to be trauma-informed, you're kind of constantly having to, it is a lifelong journey and that you're constantly having to iterate. Um, and in one of the case studies, we talk about um, the Children's Crisis Treatment Center in uh, Philadelphia that they, you know, implemented the sanctuary model well over a decade ago, but are still still have biweekly meetings um, about how they are implementing trauma informed care throughout their organization. And then finally, to get to this sort of like not just what you're funding, but how you're funding. We uh, talk about the these principles for trauma-informed grant making. Um, so we start with the acknowledgement of power structures and that there is an inherent power um, imbalance between funders and their grantees. Um, and that, you know, acknowledging that and having some self-awareness as the funder that, um, you know, can go a long way to build the kind of relationship that is more in partnership with your grantee rather than um, this sort of more um, uh, transactional relationship. Um, and then deeply rooted in that is that, you know, we have to integrate diversity, equity, and, and inclusion to all of our work. And that starts internally at foundations and thinking about our board and staff um, how do our staff and board reflect the communities that we're working with? How can our organization be more inclusive of voices that have been historically oppressed and remain silenced even to this day? Uh, and asking really those tough questions about hiring, promotion, pay equity. Um, and that, you know, that can ultimately set a different tone for, by doing that internally for, um, you know, your work externally. And that we also have to, um, you know, work with organization or think about um, how this translates to the grant dollars that we're giving. Like, are we, um, are, does our grant, for, grant portfolio reflect our values of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Um, are we giving to organizations that have largely white leadership? Um, and you know, do the organizations that we are funding, do they consider how our nation's history of racism and oppression really impacts their work? And then, you know, this also leads us to think about empowerment and voice and um, thinking about how we're ensuring that communities and organizations have the opportunity to shape our funding strategies, like how much input are organizations that are ultimately the beneficiaries of our dollars shaping where those dollars are going? And, you know, that our, our work ultimately requires a lot of patience and flexibility um, and that integrating more voices uh, will take more time and that it is not just a rush about a rush to outcomes, but also how do we, um, you know, sort of take uh, pride in the process and recognize process as an outcome in, in and of itself. Um, and, 
you know, we also need to be thinking a lot about transparency and demystifying the, um, demystifying philanthropy that, um, you know, oftentimes it can be really challenging for organizations to understand sort of what's going on behind closed doors in conversations about who gets dollars. So, um, you know, thinking more about how we can be more transparent about our process and also providing feedback to everyone, um, regardless of, you know, both if they are receiving a grant, if they're not receiving a grant, um, and, you know, having those, those tough conversations with, with folks. Um, and I, think also that we we must be responsive um, and that you know events don't happen in grant cycles and we learned that you know really starkly with COVID-19 um, and that we can you know use we can do things like use discretionary funds and set up rapid response funds um, and we saw a lot of sort of the abandonment of sort of the old way of philanthropy during COVID and um, really thinking about how to, you know, keep that moving forward. We also have to think about creativity and risk taking um, and that, you know, we're not always going to be funding evidence based practices that, um, you know, really in our role as philanthropy, we have the space to um, try out new approaches and test them out and see if they work and then if they're scalable. Um, and so, you know, that we have really the opportunity to catalyze innovation and catalyze uh, new programs that can ultimately bring about greater change. And that, you know, finally, all of this really requires that we listen and be humble um, and start by really listening to our grantees and our communities and integrating their feedback into all of our work. So this is really, um, there are many trends in grant making recently that I think are headed in a great direction. Um, the first of which being is uh, trust-based philanthropy, which focuses on a set of core values to advance equity, shift power, uh, build mutually accountable relationships, and that how to use those values sort of to shape your work across your culture, structures, leadership, and practice. Um, and they have, the Trust-Based Philanthropy Project has identified um, six key practices for, uh, for grant making that um, really can, you know, help to build a, a safer, healthier relationship between uh, funders and grantees. Um, and it really keeps in, um, it is very similar to sort of the, the trauma-informed principles um, and, you know, can, I think, really help funders to think about how to um, operationalize a trauma-informed approach. Another trend that we're seeing and that we're, we're testing out a lot at the Scattergood Foundation is participatory grant making. Um, and this is, you know, sort of as it sounds where you have community organizations and community members really have a seat at the decision making table. And, um, you know, in sort of looking at this continuum here, you see uh, informing at one end where grant makers are telling and non grant makers are receiving and that sort of being the much more traditional uh, version of philanthropy and moving us more toward the deciding end where there is much more of a partnership between grant makers and grant seekers. Um, and, you know, one of our projects that we have at the foundation is called the Community Fund for Immigrant Wellness, wherein we have a community advisory board and a decision making group that set a grant making strategy and our foundation pools dollars together with other foundations um, that then these organizations and individuals actually are are developing their request for proposals um, and you know coming together to actually make decisions about where the grant dollars are being spent um, rather than that happening at the staff and board level at the foundation and we've seen tremendous success. And I think, you know, the conversations that have happened there have really rippled out through the rest of our, our work at the foundation. And so finally, the last kind of element of the guides is leveraging resources and relationships. Um, so, you know, we advocate that funders can do a lot more than just sort of those individual um, grants and working with individual organizations. 
um, but that through advocating for broader, broader systems change, supporting cross-sector collaboration, and building the field through evaluation, we can have a much broader impact. Um, and I know that this will there will be an entire workshop series on policy and systems change, so I won't get too deep into this, but um, there is a, a really nice framework about sort of um, trauma event, preventive policies through trauma specific policies uh, in the first guide that's very helpful. And I might be trying to be mindful of time. Um, one uh, way that we've done this at the foundation is through our um, Place Matters report about Philadelphia's children, Philadelphia children's health and well being, where we took uh, five risk factors and five protective factors and looked at them across council manic districts in Philadelphia and then actually ranked the council districts, which city council loved, um, but that we ranked them uh, according to the sort of combination of risks and protective factors. Um, and, you know, ultimately this is, is a tool that council can use to say, you know, this council district has really significant um, risk factors and really not as many protective factors. Um, so how can we uh, use our resources to best target that district? Um, and one of the risk factors that we looked at was um, prevalence of adverse childhood experiences. So that was, you know, integrated into this mapping project. So this is uh, the companion infographic to the guides um, around collaboration and cross-sector networks and what the role of philanthropy is. So, uh, you know, first and foremost, obviously funding is a significant role of philanthropy that, um, you know, we can provide funding for staffing and for projects and also evaluation support. Um, and that we can champion these cross-sector networks by really amplifying their work and that we can foster collaboration, um, that philanthropy really sits in this unique space of not having to um, be seeking out dollars. And so we, we can do the work to really convene partners and bring people together that um, may not otherwise come together. Um, and then finally, um, you know, we, really think that evaluation is absolutely critical in all this work um, and that, you know, we really need to be uh, thinking about how do we um, evaluate the programs that are using a trauma-informed approach and how do we learn and sort of continuously grow uh, upon the work that we have been doing. So one of the things that we have at the foundation is a capacity building initiative around evaluation called RISE. Um, and we work with, we've worked with over a uh, hundred organizations in the greater Philadelphia region to build their internal capacity for program planning and evaluation. Um, and a part of that has really been talking with, with these organizations about how they integrate a trauma-informed approach in their work um, and how ultimately uh, trauma-informed practice can really be um, a tool to achieve the outcomes that you are you know, seeking to achieve. Um, and that, you know, oftentimes funders will sort of uh, impose uh, metrics upon uh, an organization and say, you know, you have to reach these specific metrics uh, without sort of that, that conversation with the grantee to say, you know, what is it that you all are looking to achieve and how can we be a partner in helping you achieve that and helping you understand um, how that was or was not achieved and why. Um, and so really thinking about how funders can um, support program evaluation and also support a culture of evaluation within organizations. So all that was um, a mouthful and I um, you know, really hope that you all will um, take a look at the guides that are on our website at scattergoodfoundation.org under the think section. Um, and there's a lot more in there about uh, sort of everything that we talked about here. And, um, you know, I'm just really thankful that I was able to join the group today. And, um, I, you know, hope that this was helpful in thinking about 
and, you know, how you all think about you know, working with foundations and for any foundations on the call um, for how you do your work. So thank you all so much. Hey, Lynn, thank you so much. That was absolutely outstanding. And to know more about Scatter Good and, Good and all the resources that you bring to the trauma space is, is just really impressive and, and very exciting, very exciting opportunities that you offer. So, so thank you. Um, I, I, if you take a look at the Q&A, there might be some, but we do want to move on um, to our next speaker. But thanks, thanks again, that was great. Thank you. I'm going to introduce Suzanne O'Connor now from the United Way of Greater Philadelphia and New Jersey. Um, and she is the trauma-informed region senior advocate. The state hey, thank you. Uh, great. And um, great to follow Caitlin. We, uh, we work across the street from each other in Philadelphia. Um, I'm going to share my screen right now and get started. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, hi everybody. My name is Suzanne O'Connor. Um, I uh, work at a United Way in southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, and the name of my talk today is because of preschool expulsion. Um, 10 years of investment, trauma informed care investment priorities and outcomes at a local United Way. Um, this is a picture over here on the right um, of a childcare program that I used to work at, and we'll revisit that um, a little bit later. Um, I have about 15, 20 minutes with you all, and, and what I'm going to cover is a little bit about my story and how this work kind of came to be. Um, and then United Way as a funder, what goals we set, what do we achieve, and where do we go from here? And so a little bit about me, I'm a teacher by trade, an early childhood teacher. Um, and when I first started out, the picture on the left is um, of the child development lab at Penn State University. I was a, a teacher. Um, the children in my programs were um, the, the children of professors. And, um, you know, we had to convince professors to let their children play. And they were, you know, they wanted the academic stuff. It was just a beautiful, wonderful setting you know, its own unique set of challenges. Um, and then after I left there and relocated back to Philadelphia, I worked in Head Start and ultimately um, was the director of what you see at the top right on that sign. It was the YWCA of Germantown. Um, it lost its charter, um, but this used to be an old bank um, and the Y was down the street. And I came into this program when we had about 15 kids, got some grants um, and then the opportunity to work with my uh, United Way on quality improvement came along and that's how I ended up at United Way. But coming into this work, you can see that I have a very uh, keen eye on privilege and why the children on the left-hand side of the screen um, have access to so much. And then the children in the right-hand side um, really didn't, we, we really struggled. Um, this is where we're located. Um, in Philadelphia, we cover South Jersey um, and three counties in Southeast Philadelphia or Southeast Pennsylvania. Um, United Ways have been merging over the years. So we are a very large United Way. We cover eight counties um, and we cover two states. And I know some other United Ways do that. And that presents its own set of challenges when it comes to um, policy and advocacy. Um, but as you can see, we have a very large footprint and um, my title changed about five years ago to be the advocate for a trauma-informed region. Um, and I started this work um, uh, in childcare, came to United Way in 2004. So I've been there um, 18 years now. And um, I came to United Way right from the childcare field to help with quality improvement. Um, and so uh, that's, that's what happened there. Um, so we did have at our United Way a long track record of support for early childhood in that sector and parenting education. Um, but it's here that we ran into preschool expulsion. Um, and all of the money that we poured to help our childcare centers improve their quality, we were still getting reports of children being expelled, difficult parents, staffing challenges. And that was really the reason why our United Way took that turn because we're like, what's going on here? Why aren't these children thriving? What's happening? So this is a little bit of that context. So that's the problem that we were faced. 
And then in 2009, a longtime United Way supporter um, came to United Way um, and wanted us to uh, get parenting education training into childcare centers. Now, what I forgot to mention here, and there's a little person at the bottom right, one of the things that happened to me at the Germantown Y was that I got a grant to do parenting education at my child care center from the city of Philadelphia. And one of the requirements was that I had to attend professional development with Lakeside Global Institute. And so when I took those classes as a, to take parenting classes, I was an early childhood person. I had no idea. This opened up my, my whole world. We got really excited about it. And in 2009, we got money to bring those classes to other childcare centers. And since I had already sampled it, I felt like I won something. I was asked to even be in charge of it. So how can we bring this rich parenting information into a childcare program where typically nobody knows about that information? We're not trained to work with parents and challenging or difficult children. Um, Philadelphia at that time was at the center of cutting edge. Uh, we have local experts like uh, Dr. Sandy Bloom, Diane Wagenhals, who wrote all of the curriculum for Lakeside. I, I believe she's on this call as well. And then also Dr. John Rich. Some of you might have heard Healing Hurt People and others. So there was a lot. It was a very exciting time for Philadelphia. We were, we were going to make our city trauma-informed. At that time, um, with the parenting work, it was around 2009 that um, Diane started to um, do courses on trauma. She started out with an enhancing trauma course, a deepening trauma, and an advanced trauma course, 72 hours of training. So this is all going on during this time. Um, our guiding principles at this time for the work was that, as um, Caitlin mentioned, a big paradigm shift. We knew that we were against like a, a very um, solid mental model about behavior and, and what that, why people behave the way they do. Um, we knew that it had to be cross-sector, um, and we knew this was a new field. There was much to be developed, and there was much to be evaluated. And then the other key part was that I learned that trauma training can also be traumatizing. And at United Way, our budget, most of the budget that we spent, we spent about a million dollars a year on trauma. About 80% of that went specifically to training. Um, and what I love here on the right-hand side um, is that we really believed and we loved the use of the public health pyramid to describe our work. It's, it's one of those um, infographics that can be used in any sector, really. But for me and my focus on early childhood, you know, I wanted to make sure that we were hitting and and and. and thinking about interventions at all of these levels where they didn't exist. Okay, and so here were our goals. Trauma training, 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 training. We wanted from pe people to go from just knowing about trauma and awareness training to higher levels of trauma-informed care competencies and evaluations. And like I mentioned, that's where we, we put most of our, our investment. We also knew that by doing this, we were creating champions. I'm a very big um, proponent of the whole early adopter theory. And this is definitely something that, um, that we've used throughout this initiative in terms of how we, we think about launching something. Um, we wanted individuals and organizations to become advocates um, within their own capacities for the way that we can um, assume responsibility for putting all of this trauma work into practice. Now we had all of the training, but we still didn't know really what specifically we had to do, but we knew that we could really inspire people um, and get people excited to join this journey with us. As I mentioned, early childhood development, a big concern of mine, we wanted to help child care centers provide um, trauma-informed program from classroom curriculum all the way to how we serve and support parents with parenting education. And then the other goal was around well, what are those interventions um, that we have for children zero to five? Um, what are those clinical and behavior services for those children who are at risk for preschool expulsion? Um, and what we did there was, I'm very excited, is that we were able to invest in the neurosequential model of therapeutics. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So this was our goals, kind of our strategy here. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the training. 
Um, and why this is so important, because I think as communities take this on, as funders take this on, there is a range of training that you can take. Um, not everybody needs a lot of training. And so uh, what Diane at Lakeside did was she uh, created something she calls the continuum of sophistication with regard to trauma education. And I believe there's other models that other people have used. This will be very familiar to you, but it serves as a construct to enhance overall awareness and understanding of what it means to be trauma informed. Not everybody has to move along a continuum of trauma informed training. But each of these areas that I'm about to show you presents knowledge levels in multiple related um, domains. So as people move along this continuum, they become better equipped to meet trauma-related needs. Um, and not, this is also a non-clinical model um, to bring levels of trauma education to large number, numbers of people who impact children and families. It's very much our belief that you don't necessarily need a clinician to help somebody heal from trauma, that through the education that United Way was funding, we were teaching people the skills around active listening um, and those types of skills I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you in a second, but this is why training is so important to us. Um, and so um, there's a continuum that goes from trauma aware to trauma competent. Um, different hours are involved with, you know, we're talking an, an awareness training is only about two to four hours. But um, trauma competent, um, that's about 120 hours or more. Um, outside, that, that includes your outside reading and case studies. And you can see from where you go on the left hand side from basic awareness all the way through ever growing knowledge and skill base on that second row. There's degrees of appreciation for models. We're going to be sending out this PowerPoint so you can read all of the words, but I just want to show you, show you where. Um, oops. Um, the different kinds of um, what we're considering when we talk about becoming trauma competent. We're talking about the awareness of um, an understanding of brain development, um, the impact um, of training on participants, and then what those competencies will be. So from awareness, you know, you have acknowledgement. And actually, two-hour training goes a long way. I'm really interested in following up what I'm doing right now as people that have taken awareness training and just that two hours and the shifts that they have and they're thinking and the connecting. Um, but we really at United Way wanted people to move up to trauma competency because really in order to lead deep change, to lead people, um, you really have to have a, a more sophisticated understanding um, and knowledge around um, trauma-informed care. So that's, that's our training um, kind of scope. Um, and to date, we've trained over 14,000 people in trauma awareness. Um, and I believe there's something like 2,000 that are trauma competent. Um, and now I'm going to talk about um, a clinical intervention that United Way invested in, and it's called the Neurosequential Model of Therapeutics. Many of you might know this. This is Dr. Bruce Perry's work from Child Trauma Academy. Um, and it's not a therapy, but it's an assessment. I'll just read this here in, in the event you don't know. It's a developmentally sensitive, neurobiologically informed approach to clinical problem solving. It's not a technique or intervention. It integrates core principles of neurodevelopment and traumatology to inform work with children, families, and the communities in which they work. And why we went in this direction, first of all, we read his books in Diane's courses, but this particular assessment you can do on a one-year-old a two-year-old, a three-year-old, a four-year-old. This is, this is what the early childhood field needs is this understanding. And I'm gonna show you just basically very high level. I'm not a clinician, I'm a pre-K teacher by trade, but I was be, um, able to participate in our training cohorts when we did this. And basically what happens is there's an assessment that's done that's combined with current functioning and you can see at the bottom here where it says typical six to seven year old. That's actually just a, a representation of the brain and the, the bottom part where it's green, that's the brain stem. And then the middle areas, uh, you know, the midbrain. And then at, you can see at the top where those sevens, that yellow row is, that is, um, that's the cortex. And what this assessment is able to do is assess a child that's struggling. Um, 
and then see where in that child's brain, what each of those boxes represent is a different function of, of, of your brain, of your body. And you can see here um, on the right-hand side, if the box is, is red or pink, um, there's some undevelopment or some severe dysfunction. Um, and as it's green, um, there's, it's developed. Um, and you can see a typical seven-year-old, you know, their brain isn't fully developed. Their lower brain should definitely be bright green. But you can see this child here, the six-year-old, definitely has been through a lot. And the implications are, is that we don't necessarily use talk therapy, we have to use sensory intervent interventions. Um, and so that's where a lot of our work led us. That lower part of the brain is occupational therapy. And that's something that we learned along the way that we have brought into our work around early childhood education. And so this NMT map for the field of education just unlocks so much potential and shows the resiliency of the brain when you're able to figure out what's going on, what's happened to you, not what's wrong with you. And that's why I love, love, love this work. And we continue to um, fund therapists um, to, to understand and be able to do this assessment. Very passionate about this stuff. I think it's so important. The other thing that we've done um, is um, build coalitions around trauma-informed care. Um, Pottstown is a, an urban community about 40, 25, 30 miles northwest of Philadelphia. They have a, um, a coalition. Philadelphia has an ACES coalition. Um, the Bucks Monco Collaborative, those are two counties. Um, I actually staff um, and help start the Delaware County Trauma Alliance. We meet monthly, we network, we support each other, we bring in speakers. Um, and then the other coalition that we helped launch was Pennsylvania's um, Heal PA, United Way of PA. Um, lots of states have local United Ways and then most have a statewide United Way and we were able to partner um, and help get that launched. And why this is important is because um, at a statewide level, there is a lot of movement around Pennsylvania becoming a trauma-informed state. But we all know once we get you know, new governors that that momentum at the state policy level um, can fade. And that's why we wanted United Way to, um, to be the champion and help lead this work um, you know, through all of those changes. So we were very excited um, to be able to support that and happy about the direction that that's going. Um, what we did um, at United Way, because we've been working on this for 10 years, is that we um, invested in doing a retrospective of the work from 2009 to 2019. Um, so that's a 10 year, what happened over those 10 years. And um, the approach that we took was that we uh, asked, uh, we did 18 interviews um, with 20 different background and research and 18 interviews with 20 individuals familiar with aspects of United Way's work. So whether you were involved in a coalition, um, you were involved in the training, you were involved in the NMT work, um, independently, we um, had some interviews. Um, and I'll show you, I'll share with you. Uh, I had that report available. Um, it's a long report. There's an executive summary, summary but happy to share you know, what we learned. Um, one of the things that we did was um, evaluation and research. Um, here's a picture of uh, one of my favorite people, Dr. Bob Whitaker. Sandy Bloom introduced me to, he's at Columbia right now. But we were able to do a random control trial with our first trauma course with Head Start teachers at the School District of Philadelphia. And this is what, what Bob had to say. He said the whole trauma-informed care field could collapse under its own weight if it went too much longer without real study. People will dismiss the entire area if they don't move at some point to do rigorous evaluation. And I'll tell you what, in our, we did two, we did the evaluation and traditional measures, we didn't see a lot of movement, a lot of shifts. And for those of you who do research, you know, sometimes people get a little bit worse before they get better in terms of therapy or these kinds of awarenesses. But we were able to successfully publish um, those results in JAMA. And then a follow up with what, what really would happen, the more qualitative work was studied, uh, was published in the um, oh, tri uh, Child Care and Neglect. Um, journal. Um, and so we were able to, to publish research. And I keep getting Google's, Google alerts, and this research does keep getting cited. So it's really important 
like, um, like Caitlin mentioned, for funders to fund research. Um, a big outcome with, with, with Lakeside, and this was intentional, um, has grown over the last 10 years to a nationally known authority on trauma. Um, and in this um, retrospective, th these were quotes um, that they, uh, if it wasn't, uh, that they, they um, attributed um, us to, to their success in being able to um, go all over the state, um, even internationally. Um, and overall, the interviewees, and this is, you know, this is one of these things like a tipping point, like at what point are we trauma informed as a region? You know, we'll never be able to, to measure that. That's more aspirational. But everybody agreed that trauma, uh, trauma awareness has drastically increased over the last 10 year period. Lots of reasons for that, including mainstream media. But um, uh, my friend Shannon Thomas and Delco, you know, said if it wasn't for United Way going into Delaware County and sharing all of this knowledge and resource um, with the other states in the counties, she said, I don't know where everybody would be. There's been a lot of growth around the understanding of trauma how we train families, our youth, our stakeholders. So this is really spread. So we're really excited about that. Um, one more note about our training. Last May, we had 200 slots available, 600 people registered within two days, and we had 400 people on a waiting list. Some of the barriers to our work, obviously time and resources. Again, the trauma training takes a long time. The NMT training takes a long time. Um, and it's expensive, um, but we were able to pull it off. Um, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm just so proud of our United Way. Um, what facilitated trauma-informed care? Um, what's happening around all over the country is this new research, the dissemination of ACEs study and brain science is becoming more popular. I remember when I first started this work at United Way, I had somebody there that actually told me not even to use the word trauma. I wasn't allowed to use that. That was too strong of a word in our united way. And now look where we are. One other thing that we were able to help produce um, at our Delco Trauma um, Coalition, Widener University um, would send several faculty to join us. And um, my coalition wanted, you know, how do we tell if organizations are, are, are trauma informed? And they developed and it's being put online. There will be a free version. Um, is the Trauma-Informed Services Assessment Survey. Well, there's a typo there. Um, and I think the acronym is gonna be TISIS. Um, Self-report, it's gonna be online. There'll be a free version, but you can also get consultation. Again, a cross-sector way to um, assess um, the different programs in your program or in your, um, in your organizations to see if they're trauma-informed. Lessons learned, change takes time, patience and um, Venture funding is important. Um, some folks talked about me. Leadership is important. I'm kind of a maniac and really passionate about this. So I'm definitely pushy um, with this work. Um, you need training. Uh, it's hard to become a trauma-informed community organization. Some people think they know it and have lived experience, but the training gives us the common language and the common understanding that we all need. And I think we all know trauma looks different in different settings. Um, but there's lots of connections to be made. Um, restorative justice, social emotional learning. Again, these are not new concepts. They've been called different things. Um, but as Jesse said um, recently, you know, this is the thing. Trauma is the tide that floats all of the boats. Um, you have to trust the process. This is very hard if you're doing this work. It's a difficult and delicate subject. You can't force it on people. Some of those courses that I told you about, I would tell people you can't force people to take trauma courses because they will be doing some of the process and reflection and some people might be in their own crisis and, and not be able to be in, in a group. So that's what I meant too about trauma training being traumatizing. You really have to be a good consumer when you're picking your training partners. Um, and then this last, um, this last quote around um, our advantages to move um, the trauma work and just our long standing history. So United Way has a brand and if we advertise training, you know, people come and that's the, that's the advantage of, of being um, at a United Way. And again, our results on the left, here's a picture of our trauma coalition. Um, we've impacted 14,000 individuals, 4,000 organizations, two sectors, um, early childhood. I didn't get into it too much out of school time. We have four coalitions that we started 
We've done seven evaluations and published three papers, and we have our new um, assessment tool. Moving ahead, um, there's lots to be done um, through this work. Fortunately, post the COVID crisis has really lifted this topic um, along with the racial justice movement. Um, there's, uh, it's forced innovation, the whole pandemic. And so everybody I think is really, we have money coming um, to support mental health. So this is a really good time for this movement to begin to scale. Um, and so we are definitely positioned to do that. I think moving ahead, and I'll end with these few thoughts, um, where I feel our work is moving is um, around this, um, this paper, this blog post that CTIP just um, shared around um, racism. And to be anti-racist is to be trauma-informed. Uh, when we talk to people about what gets in the way of, of implementing trauma-informed practice, there's really deep-seated racial, structural, cultural issues um, that prevent people from even thinking and, and talking about it. So we really, my next few years is really digging in deep to this work. And then also my early childhood work. Um, I'm calling it the evolution of early childhood from where we were thinking cortex prepare for kindergarten to the you know, social emotional movement, use your words in the 90s. Um, and that, that movement has come a long way. But what I'm trying to share is that, ah, there's an evolution that's gonna go deeper in the brain around sensory motor development. Um, I've also developed this kind of plug and play. So how do you become trauma informed? You start with on the left, becoming trauma aware, kind of stop there and reflect and plug some things in. And then you see who wants to go on to more advanced training. You need some type of quality improvement tool um, with your sector standards and then crosswalking them with the six key um, SAMHSA principles. Um, there's not a lot of tools out there. There are some. Um, CTIP is creating um, a handbook around early childhood education, but it's not gonna be a checklist and standards. So we're really you know, being careful about how we walk that. And then you need coaching. We need people not just to be able to train, but how do you coach um, somebody to handle a situation differently or to you know, rethink their policies? And then look at that. There's me and Dr. Perry. I got to go to a conference and present with Diane years ago. Um, and so that's the, that's the end of my, um, my talk. Absolutely fabulous, Suzanne. Very exciting. All the work that you've done, um, all the groundwork that you've laid. Thank you very, very much for that. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Absolutely. We're going to uh, jump to uh, Dr. Tony Biglin next. He's a senior scientist at the Oregon Research Institute and the uh, founder of Values to Action. Tony, there we go. Okay. <laughs> there we go. All right. Suzanne, if you can check Q&A, that would be perfect. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you, but can't see you, Tony. Well, I don't know why. There, that should do it. Does that I do think it? you need to start my video. There, there, I there we are. There you are. You're all good. Done any better? And without me, hey. So uh, my journey starts uh, at 2009, 2008, 2009. I was on the National Academy of Medicine report on prevention. And we came to the conclusion in reviewing all the evidence that we really have the science to ensure that virtually every young person arrives at adulthood with the skills, interests, values, and health habits they need to lead a productive life in caring relationships with other people. And that sort of got me on a journey. I was on also on the 2019 National Academy report uh, where we said, mm, yeah, that progress has been made. We still haven't translated it into changes in, throughout the, the country or throughout societies. So anyway, uh, the 2009 effort led me to write a book called The Nurture Effect 
I would argue that nurturing environments are the key to human thriving and that the way, the, the most effective way to reduce trauma is to focus on creating environments that nurture well being. And I think there are four qualities in, uh, in, um, in um, that make for nurturing environments. I'm sorry, I had to stop to get my timer going, so I won't take too much time. The first aspect of nurturing environments is that they minimize toxic biological and social conditions. Toxic bio biological conditions like high levels of omega-6 in the diet or high levels of airborne lead, but also, and perhaps most importantly, social conditions that involve aversive and coercive, a punitive, discriminate, discriminatory uh, behavior toward people. We need to minimize those kinds of conditions. And basically, if you look at all of the family and school and community interventions that have been shown to have benefit, what they fundamentally involve is in reducing those kinds of biological and, and social uh, toxins and replacing those with a lot of positive support for uh, caring and, 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 and development. So the, the second aspect of uh, nurturing environments is that they richly reinforce all kinds of pro-social behavior. And I'm not talking about anonyms and stickers. I'm talking about listening and caring and joining and cooperating and appreciating and showing gratitude and so on. And these are, I think, vital to the development of children and to the development of all of us. Third aspect of nurturing environments is that they limit opportunities and influences for problem behavior. Opportunities like kids being home alone without adult supervision in the after, after school hours and influences on problem behavior like the marketing of cigarettes and alcohol and unhealthful food and, and uh, opioids. Uh, that are causing as much as a million uh, excess deaths a year. And last but not least, nurturing environments promote psychological flexibility, which is the ability to mindfully pursue our values, even in the context of thoughts and feelings that are distressing and that make us move away from valued living. So, um, I've been, this is one of the things that I've been working on is to try and advance these conditions. And the second uh, is I wrote a book called Rebooting Capitalism, where we can, how we can forge a society that works for everyone. And that book talks about how and why the U.S. developed a rapacious form of capitalism and what we can do about it. So between these two books, I basically have turned from doing research uh, to how we can get the, what we know widely and effectively adopted, which is what the 2019 uh, National Academy report emphasized was needed. So we created a nonprofit called Values to Action, and it's dedicated to evolving a more nurturing, more nurturing societies. And the main way we've been working is to create action circles. And I would argue that they're one strategy for addressing our many problems. I'm not saying it's the strategy. I think we need varieties of ways of trying to do this and we'll select over time the ones that work best and, and keep those and build those and, and you know, back off from the ones that aren't working. So our proposition to people who have joined Vallist Action and now there are about 200 people who have joined is that if you're not satisfied with the state of the world, action circles give you an opportunity to do something about it. They consist of a small group of people who come together to advance a very specific improvement in society. And typically they work for about two months. They ask people to devote no more than a, an hour or so a week. Uh, and we work together and we produce a product that could be, that's a foundation for the building the society that we need. So by being time limited, they give you a way to contribute to change that doesn't require you to quit your job, your education, your family, or your recreation and to put you in contact with like-minded nurturing people. So action circles that we've created thus far, and we've only been at this for a little over two years. One is on strategies for increasing the use of evidence-based social emotional learning schools. And we're particularly focused on the PACS Good Behavior Game, which is in about 50,000 classrooms nationwide and cooperative learning, which has a long history of improving outcomes for kids and for improving the social relationships among kids and reducing uh, discrimination. 
Uh, another action circle has uh, focused on increasing the use of effective reading instruction. Another one has uh, increased is focused on increasing the availability of behaviorally skilled personnel in healthcare settings, especially focused on kids with developmental disabilities because very often they receive inadequate care, uh, even diagnostic procedures are ones that the child gets so upset that they can't do the procedure. So we have a cadre of, of behaviorally skilled people and we're trying to get more of them working in hospitals and clinics. And we have written a guide uh, for how that can be done that documents the, the terrific knowledge that people have that could help in those hospital and clinic settings. Then we've written a guide to reforming juvenile justice in your community. We've also, uh, we're working on a paper that summarizes industries that market uh, products that cause uh, as much as a million deaths a year, tobacco, alcohol, um, uh, guns, uh, and uh, unhealthful food are examples. And then we're working on increasing pro-social values, norms, and behaviors in communities. And another set of action circles have been focused on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And lastly, but not least, we have an effort to try to defend against the attack on democracy. All of these are things that we think are essential to creating environments that minimize the harm to not only children, but to adults and that make our uh, communities more nurturing. So let me just talk a little bit more about one of these as an example, reducing disparities in reading skill. We've had effective methods for teaching reading uh, over that were established more than 40 years ago. We know how to make sure that every child learns to read, but we've done a terrible job of succeeding in, in making that uh, instruction available. And so, uh, and as a result, the National Assessment of Educational Progress found that in 2019, only 35% of fourth grade students were proficient in reading, while 36 lacked even basic skill. A child who lacks basic skill in reading is at in third grade is very unlikely to ever become a competent reader and it makes the likelihood of uh, uh, intergenerational poverty greater it uh, it it really sentences a child to, to failing in school. And the proportion of black and Hispanic children who lack basic skills is significantly higher for the pop than for the population as a whole, so these reading disparities are a fundamental factor in uh, the disparities in health uh, and, and well-being that we have in society. So we identified a menu of evidence-based strategies for improving reading skill. One of it involves educating parents in the community about the importance of reading skill using traditional community organizing methods. And the second is training and consultation and effective reading instruction for teachers who, are, who aspire to improve their outcomes in reading. We can do that. The third, however, is supplemental instruction in reading using evidence-based methods that are provided by community volunteers and parents. And we are seeking to develop this system such that we can help communities improve uh, the uh, success of, of uh, kids in reading. Uh, two methods are available for supplemental instruction. One is Funix, which is a computerized reading instruction program using direct instruction principles. And the second is teach your child to read in 100 easy lessons. And this is the book, uh, Teach Your Child to Read in 100 Easy Lessons. It's a little dog-eared. I used it to teach my two kids to read. And one day my wife and I had to take the grandkids while well, the kids went out on a date night. And I had to read a story to Grayson at age, when he was about four. And I said, what would you like me to read? And he pulls out this very same uh, volume that his dad was using to teach him to read, to read him a story. So I always have to tell that story. So imagine hundreds of action circles around the country that are working on increasing the use of phonics-based reading instruction. We're convinced that we can significantly reduce this problem, which is undermining well-being of so many. The generic features of action circles are that they uh, what we do is we try and design something that could be used by a local action circle. So the generic features are that we identify a specific problem. We document it, its incidence and prevalence in the population, its deleterious consequences, and its cost to the individuals involved and to the society. 
Then we identify any empirically based programs, practices, or policies that have been shown to affect the problem. Our notion is that if we identify those, that's what the first step in getting them more widely adopted by helping specific communities adopt those programs. We also uh, examine the degree to which additional research is needed to strengthen our ability to affect the problem. For example, uh, we're forming an action circle uh, that's going to focus on uh, police misconduct. And I, that's an area where there is some research, but I, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that we're going to find that there's a lot more research that's needed on policies and programs that actually work to reduce police misconduct. Um, and then we specify interventions that could be implemented in a local community, and we design a protocol for local action circles, and we have some of the best people uh, on community organizing as part of our uh, organization uh, working on that. So the last thing I'll talk about is uh, nurturing communities. Um, we've come to the conclusion that the optimal way to improve well-being is to work at the community level. A careful reading of the state of, politi uh, of the political system in this country suggests that as a nation, we're in for years of conservative control of the federal government and the governments of many states. And I have a uh, citation here of a book by Hacker and Pearson, Let Them Eat Tweets. And I suggest that you read that. And if you do, you will see how much uh, our democracy is threatened by the efforts to take control by conservatives. It convinces me that we are unfortunately uh, likely to have a takeover of the federal government in many states uh, by conservative forces that are opposed to all of the things that uh, uh, the last speaker, for example, was talking about in terms of reducing trauma, in terms of reducing uh, discrimination, and so on. And so we have that effort of defend democracy if you go to our website you can find out more about that and you can join that we are trying to reduce the attack on uh, democracy but i'm not optimistic and i think that we're going to as a result uh it will be impossible to implement policies and programs that can increase nurturance at the national level or in those states and so that brings us to working with individual communities i think we need to support the development of more nurturing communities and in the context of the situation in the nation, we can help to evolve islands of nurturing communities, even while conservatives are in control of the, the federal government. And I also think that it's important to include rural white communities in this. Um, if you read the last chapter of Rebooting Capitalism, uh, I argue that neither of our political parties has seen to the well-being of poor white people and that that's one of the reasons that they are uh, aggrieved and one of the reasons that it has been easy to uh, uh, convince them to vote for uh, uh, for policies and, and, and leaders who are, in fact, uh, undermining their well-being. Um, OK, so what are we doing? Well, we think that the foundational thing for helping the community would be to uh, I help the uh, community come together around a set of shared values. And so we're using what's been called the PACS vision. I mentioned the PACS good behavior game before and the fact that it's in 20, uh, 50,000 classrooms, uh, has excellent data on the way in which it improves well-being, the way in which it is trauma-informed, the way in which it reduces uh, tr trauma and overcomes the, the, the effects of trauma. Um, but we also think, and, and so the first step of the PACS uh, good behavior game is a PAX vision, where kids are simply asked to uh, say, if this were the most wonderful classroom you can imagine, what would you see more of? What would you hear more of? What would you do more of? What would you feel more of? And then kids are helped to say, well, wh ask, what would you like to see, hear, feel, and do less of? And the teacher makes a poster, which are all the things that they want to see more of, and they label that as PAX, and that they work cooperatively to increase PAX. And they ha also have uh, on the chart the things they don't want to see, and they work to reduce those. And um, we think that that's useful in communities and with adults. And so we've gone ahead and done, done this. We're working in a community in Oregon where there's been a lot of conflict, conflict surrounding uh, all the issues that you uh, are aware you know, people are arguing about in, in this country. And so we've asked 
people and we've gotten uh, so far a diverse group of uh, community leaders to come together around a vision of what they want to see here feel and do more of and what they want to see here feel and do less of uh, in the community and we intend to keep asking people to do this we want everybody to join in defining the their values because it's only when people participate uh, in uh, in their governance uh, that they really get involved and that we really make progress. So here's a word cloud of the positive things that people have uh, come up with. And I will tell you that after we did about 20 of these, we made this word cloud and then we got 20 more people, 25 more people to do it. And it, it doesn't change very much. People on all sides uh, are, are after the same things. People want to have listening and acceptance and encouragement and positives and compassion and love. Uh, these are the things people strive for. And so we believe that this lays the groundwork for subsequent activity. So our next steps in this is uh, promoting the behaviors that people aspire to see more of in the community. And we're doing that and we're just getting started with it. We're inviting people to come up with their ideas for how we can promote these kinds of values in the community. But what we're starting with is posting praise and thanks and recognition for people who are already doing these things that exemplify it. And we're doing that in social media and also on the Nurture Newberg website. This is Newberg, Oregon, we're working in. And through a participatory process, we hope to develop goals that would advance the vision. And when, once the community members have, have specified specific things they think will advance the, the, the well being in the community and the values that they've named, we hope to develop action circles to work towards specific goals to advance that vision. So that's pretty much what I have to say. And um, I believe I've done it in less than 20 minutes. Do I get a prize? You get a PAX prize, Tony, for that. <laughs> Amazing. So, um, so Jesse, do you want to come on board? And I believe our, we're going to make a, have a very, very short brain break to try and make up for a little time. Tony, by the way, that was excellent. And we look forward to hearing from you in two weeks as well during our how-to session. So, Jesse? Uh, Tony gets the prize that everybody will get the reward of, which is a fantastic brain break. And today, what we, we are just going to stick to one until instead of my normal two, I invite anybody that needs to go to the restroom, has not been able to during the wonderful information that's been shared thus far, to go now, feel free to get up, do what you need to during this time. We're going to stick to one brain break, and it is going to be face massages. We're all going to get massages right now. Our face changes as our emotions change. Again, these brain breaks, just to give credit where it's due come from the trusted brain breaks of 101 brain breaks and educational activities. So the more stressed and anxious we get, the more tense the muscles in our face can become. Taking a moment to massage our faces, especially our foreheads and cheekbones can help to relax those muscles and consequently relax our demeanors. So this is going to help support our brain state, uh, our brain stem and mid brains. This is going to be a deeper brain break sort of activity. So we can start with the cheekbones and pardon, Denny and I are just modeling the model here <laughs> of some good feeling. I, as we do this, I have gotten better at the facial massages and we can move up toward the foreheads. Um, I just started using exfoliating scrubs from Lush uh, because my skin was getting very dry, which is fantastic. So if I am glowing, that is why. And then other than the cheekbones, if the foreheads or cheekbones felt good, you can stay where it feels good. I personally feel yes to Lush. Not, we are not supporting anybody in particular, but that's, that's where I get mine as well. Uh, my, my stress is in my temple and oftentimes my jaw as well. And so you can do whatever feels good, but even that simple thing is an example of a brain break that actually helps us again, get into our bodies. It's something simple that we can do during the day. I will also just quickly before we get on to next presentations, because we are a bit over time and want to make up from some time. 
Um, last week, I, or, or two weeks ago, I know that I got, uh, I, I scared at least one child um, <laughs> during, during the lion's roar brain break. And so if anybody was on and I scared anybody, my sincere apologies. But um, I hope that we are all feeling um, in our breath. Feel free to do other brain breaks as we continue. Remember, you are not on camera. We can't see you. So feel free to look or sound as crazy as you need to. What's important is that we remain present as we continue on in this series. So Denny, that was our quick brain break there. And I will pass it back over to you for our next wonderful speaker. Okay. There we go, Dr. Susan Mims, who is the CEO of Dogwood Health Trust. Welcome. We're looking forward to your talk. Another Thank you. North Carolina and Carolinian. Oh, you can tell I just got here. Go ahead. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much um, for inviting me here. I'm so um, just thrilled to be here with these uh, so many great thinkers in this space. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen and let me see. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Beautiful. Okay. You see the, the one slide. Great. Um, right. Yeah. So I'm going to just briefly share with you a little bit about our um, dogwood story. Uh, and it, it's a bit of an origin story as we are a um, relatively new uh, foundation, private foundation in Western North Carolina and Asheville, located in Asheville and um, serving Western North Carolina. Um, we uh, we were uh, we're a, a healthcare conversion foundation created through the sale of Mission Health, which was a regional uh, hospital, and we became operational in 2019. And it you know we grew out of healthcare, and we are called the Dogwood Health Correct. Trust. You can see our our purpose here to dramatically improve the health and well being of all people and communities in Western North Carolina. And as um, um, our, our board, when they first formed, came together and really uh, thought about how do we want to go about in, in fulfilling this purpose? Um, how can we really make a difference in health and well-being? And, um, and in a region where we have people who are historically pit, uh, poorer, sicker, and older than many other parts of the country, um, and they um, came to that we're going to focus on social determination determinants of health. So we are not as funding health care services as much as really trying to go upstream. Um, and we, this is our service area. I apologize for those of you who aren't familiar with North Carolina. This is that tail end of the westernmost part of North Carolina that is sandwiched between Georgia, a little bit of Alabama, Tennessee, and uh, Virginia. So um, that this, these are the 18 counties we serve, plus uh, the Kuala boundary, which is the Eastern band of the Cherokee Indian. Uh, and as I said, um, we really, uh, in thinking about how do you really make a difference in, in the health and, uh, of, of folks, and, and that is um, what truly makes people healthy or not. And we know that the social determinants of health, um, you know, I love the, the, what I think Tony said, creating environments that nurture well-being. I think that just sums it up as what social determinants of health are. And, uh, and it's the, these um, conditions uh, and um, the absence of these factors we know uh, can make individuals and families more uh, vulnerable to trauma, things like poverty and food insecurity, you know, just not having a place to live, the physical environment. So as we began to um, 
uh, move our work forward as a foundation, uh, we kind of dived into um, the social determinants. Uh, and uh, I really, I, I didn't share my, my background before I was uh, it, with Dogwood and previously I was a pediatrician. And um, as, a, as many of you probably know, pediatricians are very familiar with uh, adverse childhood experiences and what that means in a developing, um, you know, individual developing brain and the um, the effects that those experiences have for a lifetime, uh, and actually through multiple lifetimes that they can be they can can spread through generations, and and how important that is. So the, the addressing resiliency is um, incredibly important in in this work. Uh, let's see. So, and then, you know, this, the CDC strategies I've got to, you know, we know that when we think about ACEs and we think about trauma, um, we, we are thinking about creating those systems that provide safety for trauma survivors, minimizing risk of re-traumatization and, um, and then prevention. And when we think about social determinants of health uh, as those conditions that, um, let's see, that just switch. Yeah, there were sorry about that. The conditions that um, affect a wide range of health functioning and quality of life. And, and I've had a lot of fun as I've come in thinking about the intersection of, the, of these two concepts and how they constantly interact. Uh, we know that traumatic events can actually, you know, change the chemical makeup of a brain and increase the risk of developing a variety of health issues and that um, traumatic events, um, uh, you know, really make that change and that the social determinants can increase the risk that individuals will experience traumatic events, things like the poverty, neighborhood crime and violence, uh, racism. Um, and these things really um, need to be considered together. So as we've come together as a foundation, we're really thinking about how are we promoting resilience and building pr protective factors, not just in our work in the community, but as we set up an organization. And so some of the things that as we're coming together that we've been thinking about is really, um, as I mentioned, we were formed during the twin pandemics. And I think this time of our um, coming together and talking about how we want to uh, to show up as a foundation and work with community was very impacted by the time period when we were coming uh, forming. Um, I am very grateful that our board has expressed a commitment to equity in every aspect of our work. Uh, so we are, are um, considering how, how that looks in equity with a broad definition and some very specific definitions within that. Um, we are considering in our organizational development what that means around internally uh, for our staff, for our board, learning about equity and trauma um, and, and thinking about how bringing experience, people with lived experience into our organization, whether that's lived experience with uh, trauma themselves or coming from a direct service uh, provision uh, with working with families uh, that are uh, struggling with these issues. Um, also thinking about our internal, um, our initial granting focus as we were developing our, our, our first kind of guidance uh, with the team was to really listen and learn uh, and build relationships and, and do no harm. That was one of my uh, uh, factors I brought from my medical background. Uh, and I think it's so important um, as we talk about trauma because we know that we can re-traumatize people uh, easily if we're not paying attention. Um, and we did this through, uh, as we were doing our initial granting, we uh, engaged the community in our strategic planning process uh, and, um, and really found people who are the influencers on the ground, making change, have the trust of the community. And uh, we are, as we're doing our investments in the social determinants of health, we're really thinking about how we can have a high touch 
uh, relationship with our partners uh, so that we are co-developing, co-creating. And, and one other point I just wanted to call out is we are um, granting in a way that we can ensure that our partners are paid a living wage um, and uh, all the way through trying to pass that along. Mm. So our strategic priority areas that are in housing, education, uh, economic opportunity, and health and wellness. And as I mentioned with equity, uh, really incorporated through everything that we do. And um, a little bit just about each one are, um, we know that, uh, that the social and physical environments needed to promote good health include making sure people have a safe place to sleep, to live, to be. Um, and I know as a, as a pediatrician, I saw that firsthand taking care of patients. I know I was taking care of a, a little girl uh, who was having to get surgery on her mouth, uh, her whole mouth restored, and she was going under anesthesia to have that done. And this was a major procedure. And when I was seeing her, I asked her about brushing her teeth, and she told me that she couldn't brush her teeth. And I said, why can you not brush your teeth? And she said, there was no place to spit in the back of the station wagon that was their home. And I think about the trauma that that little girl experienced from not having a home and everything else that went along with that. So, um, you know, we are have a big focus on um, creating not only affordable housing, uh, which we've invested heavily in, uh, but also um, thinking about revitalized and supportive communities that that will help mitigate some of those factors that we talked about where there are trauma exposures in communities. Oops, let's see, and, and education is another um, focus, uh, and we know that it, in all levels of education, uh, that that is a predictor of good health. And so um, we are uh, specifically funding and working with some of our, um, even from the early childhood education, our Smart Start, uh, we have a regional cohort that um, is really working on educating themselves and their partners in uh, resilience academies, um, things like reconnect to resilience trainings that they're doing and bringing Sesame Street and communities um, to these families that are engaged in their services. So in um, our economic opportunity arm, uh, just a lot of work here to help with work readiness, all the way from kind of high school, uh, giving people opportunities um, and, and, and the real productive um, uh, opportunities to have mentors, which we know uh, this actually goes down to the youngest areas where uh, having that um, adult, that one or multiple caring adults uh, to take, show interest in the lives of children makes such a difference. Thinking about how we are, are supporting that all along and continuing that uh, through high school and into working with community colleges on life coaches, uh, and um, getting people ready for the, the jobs that are so needed in Western North Carolina. Uh, we have another project we're funding around um, re-entry for people to get educated when they are justice involved and coming back into the community um, and working with the employers as well so they understand what it means to support people who've experienced trauma and to be an employer that helps set them up for success. And uh, in our health and wellness, um, uh, there are just uh, many, many um, opportunities. I probably, we're, we're working on healthy, engaged communities. Um, uh, and we actually have um, 
Oh, before I get there, uh, we do have a very specific portfolio on racial equity that I wanted to mention, uh, as that is um, it has many unique factors. Within our health and wellness, uh, we have many objectives, and I won't go through all of them, but there are a few I wanted to point out. Uh, and that is um, our 1.1 to decrease um, adverse experiences and improve individual family resilience. And we have another 1.2, which is our um, thinking about community resilience uh, and how we can um, support that. Uh, we're looking at interpersonal safety organizations that address that uh, and many other um, aspects. So I won't go through these in detail, but um, you know, as I think somebody said earlier, uh, that trauma really does uh, addressing trauma um, and preventing it cross almost every area, um, uh, all of our strategic priority areas, uh, and um, including. Um, uh, and we know that disparities are. Um, important to address. And um, substance use disorder, we are located in um, Appalachia that, and we have had uh, extremely high rates of um, substance use disorder and behavioral health. And we've all seen that increase in the pandemic. Uh, and so um, funding programs like um, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, that mentorship, uh, you know, middle, middle school activities uh, in, in um, and our work in prevention is really um, focused on, on trauma informed and trauma based services. And lastly, I wanted to mention another program that is uh, that we're involved with through the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services which is an experiment, a really interesting experiment to try to uh, see what it's like to uh, use Medicaid dollars to pay for the services that address social determinants of health and, um, and some of those you know, trauma services. Uh, and so this is a pilot um, and we have a kind of sister organization we've helped set up to implement this pilot that will allow human service organizations to um, provide services in the areas of housing and uh, addressing food insecurity, uh, transportation uh, and interpersonal safety and be able to submit a bill through a billing system to Medicaid and get paid for that. So this is a very exciting um, learning uh, pilot that, that we're involved in. Um, so I know we're running a little bit so behind, so I tried to go quickly. Um, I will be happy to answer questions at the end, but just wanted to end to say our goal is to create a Western North Carolina where every generation can live, learn, earn, and thrive with the dignity and opportunity for all, no exceptions. Thanks for um, letting me share a little bit today. Thank you so much, Susan. Mm -hmm. That was really just such a beautiful talk. And um, the work that you're doing is so really transformative, especially for the, the Western part of North Carolina, but it has so much, so many implications as a model for other areas with similar characteristics across the country. We really appreciate that and have really got so much out of your talk. Great. I'm excited to connect you. with you more. Yes, take care. Thank you so much. I'm gonna introduce uh, Romeli Bannock, and uh, she is a Senior Program Officer for Child Wellbeing with the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. Welcome, Romeli, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Thank you for having me here. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Well, hello everyone. Um, Thank you for, for joining and thank you again for the invitation uh, to, to be here and, and talk a bit about uh, my work. Uh, my name is Rumeli Bannock, Senior Program Officer in the Child Wellbeing Program at the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. I've been with the foundation, which I'll, call, I'll refer to as DDCF, um, for uh, uh, nearly six years. And my background is in developmental psychology uh, and previous to uh, my previous work included uh, working in academia and as well as providing direct services to children and families. 
So I'll start with um, what DDCF's vision is, which is here supporting the well being of people and the planet for a more creative, equitable, and sustainable future. Um, and we do this uh, through our mission of improving lives um, in, uh, through grant making in, in the fields and areas that Doris Duke was interested in, uh, including the performing arts, environment, medical research. Uh, we have a program that fosters connections between Muslim and non-Muslim cultures in the US and uh, the child well-being program, which I lead. Um, so Doris Duke uh, had, took a, a special interest in preventing uh, cruelty to children. And uh, we originally started off as the child abuse prevention program and supported a lot of um, parenting programs and, and direct interventions um, and direct services. Uh, and, and around 10 years ago, uh, we went, underwent a major uh, strategic shift, uh, recognizing that uh, while it's important to prevent child maltreatment, we also want to promote um, health and well being and thriving of children, families, and communities. And so, our mission is to uh, promote children's healthy development and protect them from abuse and neglect. Um, and it, through our strategy shift, we've also been moving more upstream in how we want to create and, and support an ecosystem uh, that promotes. Um, uh, ch child and family well-being and, and strengthening uh, families. Uh, so before I get into our strategy areas, um, uh, and we have three of those, just want to talk a bit about our framing and, and what our kind of overarching approach is to our work. Um, we take a public health uh, prevention lens to, um, to the efforts that, that we support. Um, and, and recognizing that uh, we uh, need to uh, partner across systems and across sectors and with, with families um, and that um, to, in order to promote healthy development um, and address uh, trauma and foster resilience um, that we, um, we really need to take a more ho a, a holistic approach to um, support for children and families. Um, and this and, and the two gen or family uh, whole family framework is also core to um, um, our approach uh, where we are we look to support efforts that um, serve and um, ad advance uh, outcomes for children and their caregivers together. So um, many of our grantees work in areas like, uh, early childhood and workforce development. Um, so really looking more holistically at families. Um, we also take a strengths-based approach to the work, um, recognizing that um, there are assets uh, in individuals and in families and in communities that we can build upon um, and, um, and, and, and um, enhance and, and grow um, rather than really looking at, at and focusing on the deficits um, of, of the communities that we aim to serve. Um, we also look to um, build capacity um, around uh, data and evidence use um, for our grantees, uh, whether they're individuals or organizations um, with, with the, um, with, with kind of the, the, the theory that um, better use of data and evidence um, will result in um, uh, more effective and impactful funding and better outcomes. Uh, and finally, um, equity is centered in all of our work. Um, uh, so to get to equity, we also recognize uh, that we need to be more inclusive and include a diverse uh, people and perspectives and um, uh, uh, include those from underrepresented groups that historically haven't had, uh, may not have had the, the voice or uh, the seat at the table or the decision making power to um, determine and, and um, how, how to achieve their goals and, and how we can support thriving communities. Um, so I mentioned that we have three strategic areas, um, which are uh, across the 
across the top and I'll, I'll say a bit more about each one. Um, but uh, our, our first area is around system strengthening and coordination. And this is really for uh, the public public systems um, that, that serve uh, families. Um, we also have a portfolio around place-based initiatives uh, where we're looking to uh, support the backbone organizations of collective impact efforts that are working at the neighborhood or community level. Um, and our third area is around building capacity and sharing knowledge. Uh, and this is, through building capacity of both individuals and organizations, um, supporting leadership development, supporting the generation um, and use of research uh, and evidence um, to inform decision making. And we do have some priority populations that include uh, indigenous communities, uh, youth that are in and transitioning out of foster care, as well as low income communities. So in our first uh, strategic area, system strength and coordination, this is um, with the um, understanding that, um, that, fam that, that the families that we, we seek to, to serve um, tend to touch multiple systems. Um, so how can they work better together? How can they um, align and coordinate uh, their services and their efforts? Um, and, and really center families and center the, the needs of families to, to better serve them and, and meet them where they are. Um, so examples of uh, grantees in this portfolio include South Carolina First Steps that's um, working um, across multiple sectors. And you can see the, the partners here, both public um, and uh, um, service providers and, and academic um, institutions um, that are um, supporting uh, or, or better, better aligning and coordinating work um, in early childhood uh, education and health uh, to get to um, uh, their goals for, for, for kindergarten school readiness. Um, and, and they're doing this through expanding services, uh, implementing evidence-based curricula, as well as, well as um, using data to um, um, assess both um, how, how they're doing um, on, a, on a more shorter term level plus um, longer term impact. The National Center for Youth Law serves uh, youth who are systems involved in California and aims to improve their academic outcomes. They provide one-on-one -on -one, um, um, academic support to, to youth, uh, as well as advocate for policies um, across uh, within counties and across California uh, to promote educational success. Uh, and they also provide technical assistance to um, support uh, increased collaboration at the state, county, and community levels. Uh, and, and the last grantee I'll mention in this, uh, in this strategic area is the American Public Human Services Association. Uh, they have an initiative called Advancing Family Economic Mobility. Um, they, they had been working and they've been quite successful in New England um, in, uh, for uh, in supporting um, learning communities of that include various stakeholders, um, including policymakers, practitioners, um, researchers, and community members and families, to um, create more two gen policies and and programs, uh, in, including things like addressing the benefits cliff. And so with that success, we are looking to replicate um, the model and, and APHSA is adapting this model in the Southern states, um, as well as having demonstration sites um, to, to um, have, have more two-gen policies. Uh, the second area, uh, our second strategic area around place-based initiatives. So here we are supporting backbone support organizations um, that are bringing resources to that community, that are um, coordinating efforts of multiple stakeholders. Um, they're also um, building um, shared measurement systems and communicating about the impact of their initiative strategies. Uh, these backbone organizations um, 
tend not to um, get the the funding and maybe even the credit that they deserve um, in in how they are the the they play the cat herder role for collective impact efforts and so um, we we seek to support them. Um, here, here's an, here, here's more about what backbone organizations do. They help to develop a common agenda in a community and um, align the various stakeholders um, in mutually reinforcing activities to meet those shared goals. Um, and as I mentioned, they also um, support measurement and evaluation, um, communications, and also increased funding towards those efforts. Um, we have several place-based grantees. I'll just point out a couple of them. Um, the Vital Village Network uh, works in three uh, communities in Boston. Uh, they are completely trauma, uh, th their work is completely centered on um, um, being trauma-informed um, and, and promoting healing. Um, and they have a learning community to help with that. Um, Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation and Standing Rock CDC, they're working to, um, they're working across um, uh, fields like arts and culture, language, environment, and health um, to promote well being of um, Native American families living on, on those reservations. Um, Rock Matsu and uh, Kokoa Kalihi Valley, one in Alaska, the first in Alaska and the second in Hawaii. They are um, using traditional uh, Alaskan and Hawaiian practices to promote um, healing and, and to support and advance well being. Um, and we, 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 we find that it's very important to um, share learning. And so there is a learning community that the, Pop Chain, the Population Change Institute is facilitating to help these collective impact efforts learn from each other, talk about um, the, their challenges and, and, and um, uh, try to find uh, solutions to the, and, and brainstorm solutions to those challenges. Um, and, and really be networked um, so that, that they can um, better support and promote each other. And our third area of grant making is around building capacity and sharing knowledge. Um, we've been doing a lot here in um, leadership development for individuals, recognizing that um, many leaders of color tend to get stuck at the mid-career level and, and don't may not necessarily have the, uh, the networks or the opportunities to um, um, get to the senior and executive level positions and where, where you know, and, and to increase their decision-making power. Um, so our leadership programs support uh, professional development, networking, capacity building, um, and uh, as well as they aim to accelerate the pipeline of mid and senior level professionals um, by increasing both racial and ethnic diversity and um, individuals with lived experience who are at these senior decision-making um, positions. Uh, as part of this portfolio, we're also supporting social science researchers. Um, it, and in particular, researchers of color, um, as well as researchers that are work that are partnering with communities of color or communities that are underrepresented underrepresented in research, um, to support their their own uh, to, for, for these researchers to support their work, um, their to to support increased funding for them um, and. Um, really communicate about the findings and, and how they're working in partnership with communities. So here are some examples of um, black and indigenous researchers that we're supporting that are working in um, the, the child and family well-being spaces. Um, here, uh, many of the research projects are um, working to build resilience, promote healing and strengthen families. Um, we also are supporting a model called the research practice partnerships where researchers partner with either practitioners or policymakers on uh, um, developing and implementing a, a shared research agenda 
that produces uh, timely and relevant knowledge uh, for use by uh, practitioners and policymakers. Um, and here we've been learning a lot about um, um, power sharing and, and how to really support these partnerships to be um, effective and to uh, be impactful and long lasting, um, and as well as to, to really produce the knowledge that can inform um, decision making for policymakers and practitioners and, and the translation of that knowledge. Um, and then here's just a, it, this slide just has our, um, the leadership programs that, that are supporting individual leadership development. Um, these programs take a cohort, uh, they, they, they're based on a cohort model and, and they are, are looking to, to support and, pro, and, and promote the career trajectories of mid and senior level leaders from diverse backgrounds. Um, so this slide just gives, and I'll wrap up after this, um, our approach at DDCF has been to invest um, deeply and, um, it, and make multi-year commitments because we recognize that to achieve our goal of improved and more equitable outcomes for children and families, that, we, that, 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 that there are things for us to invest in in, in the short term, as well as um, really looking longer term at, poly, at, at how we can um, uh, transform systems and transform policies and practices that better center families and better meet their needs. So thank you. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Romelli. That was a really nice overview of everything that Doris Duke does. It's just really quite expansive. I'll take the opportunity just to thank Doris Duke again for giving us our first capacity building infrastructure grant when my coalition, the Co you know, National Prevention Science Coalition first came about and it was really instrumental in our growth. So I thank you for that. And I thank you for your talk today. Thank you, I really enjoyed being here. Oh, good, good, good. Okay, next we're gonna to go to Kentucky Bounce and I'm really excited to hear from these folks because I know very little about it and, um, and we'll get right to it. Um, it sounds like a really exciting initiative in the state of Kentucky. So there'll be three, um, is that right? Will there be three of you? Yes, um, let me see if she needs help here a little bit with her video. So I'm gonna see if I can get her going here. Yes, there we are, got you back. Um, okay, so from the Kentucky Bounce Initiative, we have Betty or BJ Atkins, who is the co-chair of the Bounce <laughs> Coalition. We have Amalia Mendoza, Senior Policy and Advocacy Officer at the Foundation for, uh, for uh, Healthy Kentucky, sorry. And Carly Mosby-Smith, Director of Strategic Initiatives at Kentucky Youth Advocates. Did I get all that right? Okay, take it away. Good, good morning. Carly, do you want to share a presentation? Thank you. My name is BJ Atkins, and I am the co-lead of the Bounce Coalition, but I've had the good fortune to be a part of Bounce before it was even Bounce. I had 15 years of career in the Louisville Metro Public Health and Wellness. We were the first public health system to open its own center for health equity, and that happened in 2006. And from there, we were very aware of the social determinants of health and were always on the lookout for opportunities to address those. In 2012, the Foundation for Healthy Kentucky released a request for proposal called Investing in Kentucky's Future. It was an opportunity that was centered around the principle of if the problem lies in the community, the solution to the problem lies with the community. So having been very much a community activist and having my feet in the community, uh, helping them to find funding to do great work to address social determinants of health, I saw this as quite an opportunity, but it was tricky because what they said is you are to write a proposal helping children between the ages of five and 18. However, you're not gonna tell us how you're going to help those children. 
And they also had some really strong components around that. There has to be a coalition that is a group of people who have worked together in the past that are willing to commit to five years around whatever your endeavor happens to be. And uh, so with that in mind, knowing that this coalition had to be decision makers, by that I mean the mayor, the superintendent of public schools, the president CEOs of healthcare systems, uh, the, et cetera, th that we had to really bring high level people. And the purpose was they would sign on before indicating their commitment in our letter of intent. And they would also say that they would stay with the project five years and they could make the decisions, therefore not delaying any time toward implementation. So I pulled a few people together and said, here are the rules and guidelines, are you on board? And they agreed they were. So we wrote our letter of intent, put it out there and it came back that we were accepted to write an application. So we developed what was called the Coalition for Legal Youth because we didn't know what else to call ourselves at that point. And uh, we applied. There was a little hesitancy from the foundation's part because there were 100,000 kids in Jefferson County Public School that were between the ages of five and 18. And they were wondering how on earth we would work with that large of a population. So we didn't know for sure what segment of that population would be our designated group, but we knew that some area of the public school system, we would find a way to implement a project. So they agreed to give us planning money and we worked together for about 12 months. The idea was to dig down into discovery through data review. We looked at data that involved teenage homelessness, teenage pregnancy, all children homeless. We looked at suicide in youth. We looked at physical health, nutritional health, mental health, uh, just everywhere. And we took turns as members of the coalition, dedicating ourselves to specific data sets and the community CEOs would be able to tell us about some physical health. The school system could talk to us about suspension. Uh, about dropout, about graduation, et cetera. And we took all this data and we, we gleaned over it. And we had such a diverse group of people that were invested in so many different areas that we knew that it would take some discussion, but it wasn't as difficult as we thought because everything we looked at was an adverse childhood experience. So that's how we came about saying adverse childhood experience is where we will begin. And at that time, there were not many people doing this work because this was 2012 and in 2013, it's when we started the discovery. And uh, there weren't many people addressing ACEs in the community or in the nation at that time. So we decided that's what we were gonna do. And we wrote a proposal and that's how Bounce was born. The intention of Bounce is forging a trauma-informed environment and systemic changes and personal knowledge around ACEs. We were defining who we are and what we were gonna do. And as the slide says, we would educate and train to build resilient youth, adults, and families, strengthen referral networks when more help is needed, measuring impact, very significant advocating for policies that support trauma-informed communities. When we looked at that, we knew that it was the adults we had to reach in order to be able to build that level of resilience. And we also knew it was important that no matter where a child went, there was an adult who understood it. So we not only focused on the school system, which we had a superintendent representative at the table who agreed with the school system approach. But we also looked at out of school time, we had the CEO of the YMCA at the table. And then we looked at the importance of at home. So all of those things were to be combined and a decision had to be made, where do we begin? 
we decided to, uh, the important component is again, relationship, relationship, relationship. Now that we have the administration signing off at Jefferson County Public Schools, we had to get into the school itself. So we built a relationship with one of the principals and we looked at the, the demographics and the outcomes of that school to decide which one we would actually be into and uh, which children had the most need. We also knew it was important to hear the school. What did the school want to see changed? What could we help the school do so that they had more success with their students? So we had a pilot school and we had a control school so we could measure our impact. The Bounce Coalition, when it's set up, we were very fortunate. We had the key evaluator for Jefferson County Public Schools as one of our members, as well as the lead psychologist. So we already had the relationship built with the principal from those with those two players. So when we went into the school system, we decided that the education to support these children, the education around ACEs and building resilience would involve everyone in the school. And we took upon to train the administration, which included the principal and the counselors, the school teachers, the cafeteria workers, the school bus drivers, and anyone else who was in the school who interacted with children during the day. The control school looked very similar in the outcome of the student population. However, the control school did not know that they were being used as such, but as control situations go. So we had the pilot, we had the control, and we were ready to take off. We had also embedded in it a self-care component for the teachers because we knew that it was very difficult for teachers. And we also knew from listening to them, while they may have felt they had gained progress from the beginning of school until winter break, they had to start over again when kids came back from Christmas vacation because a lot of the work that had been done, these children had experienced trauma while they were out of school. We implemented parental lunch and learns as a part of what we were doing. And we trained the YMCA um, staff so that when they worked with the kids in out of school time, they knew the same knowledge. That led to certification to every youth serving organization that received metro government funding. And we, to reach the community, we did a large scale screening and discussion of a film that we, um, of the resilience, the biology of science, uh, stress and the science and of hope. And this was seen by about 1000 residents. We thought it was important to, to continue to educate the community. And we set up a bounce grand rounds where people could come together, share ideas, listen to a case study and say, yeah, this is how this could be addressed or this is what my agency could give to help a school principal deal with a child issue. And we've moved that bounce grand rounds to a multitude of topics, whether it's foster care today, uh, it, it's grown tremendously, but we started with the school and the principal. The kids in the school had, were in a three tier situation. The counselor read to the children just to get the uh, understanding or just to feel where the kids were. Children with more issues bubbled up into what we called the lunch bunch. And they would meet together during lunch at the cafeteria. And um, at that time, they would just social interact and pick up some new skill sets. For parents and children who were having significant issues, we found those outside resources to help them. So those are the three components that we did within the school, out of school time, parental lunch and learns, and the community at large through a greater understanding of ACEs. What we measured, this came from what the school wanted to see, reduction in out of school suspensions, increased teacher retention, improved staff perception of skills related to youth who experience trauma, improved student climate, climate survey results and increased parental engagement. 
I thought the parental engagements was really specific when you see that we grew the PTA from zero members to 213 members. There are 525 children in the particular school that was our pilot school at that time. So we did have significant gains across the board. If we step back and what we learned from this, you've heard this before today, what we learned from our pilot school, it takes only one adult to believe in a child. We had children in the second grade who were suspended nine times prior to bounce. It took an adult to understand what was going on with that child. It isn't what is wrong with that child, but it's what happened to that child. And it's reframing the way that the interaction with the child in the classroom was done. So one teacher proved that this was correct. She asked all of our students to answer if my teacher only knew, and here are the results that she got. I have to get up, my little sister up, ready for school in the mornings. That's why we are late. I live with my grandparents because my mom and dad are in jail. My teacher is the only one that loves me. Those were real eye-opening. And it put the, reframed everything from what's wrong with this child, why won't this child learn, why is this child disruptive, to what did happen to that child. And we found that over and over. And we had similar stories from our school bus drivers as well. But this was just the history of bounce. This was the beginning of bounce for the first three years. From then, and bounce has been almost 10 years this year since we saw that RFP, bounce has been growing and it has quite a bit of reputation. And you'll be hearing about that later in the presentation. But right now, I want to segue over to Amaya. If it wasn't for the Foundation for Healthy Kentucky, who laid out the guidelines of how they wanted to see their grant proposals, or their grantee structure, what they were going to do to help children today be healthy adults, Bounce wouldn't have come about. And so, Amaya, we want to thank you. Amaya? Thank you so much, BJ, for that introduction. I'm Amalia Mendoza. I am the Senior Program and Policy Officer at the Foundation for Healthy Kentucky. Uh, the Foundation for Healthy Kentucky has been around since 2001, and I have been with the Foundation for almost nine years. Um, the Foundation has as its mission to address the unmet health needs of Kentuckians, uh, in particular by developing and promoting policies by addressing disparities and by promoting health equity. Um, one of the initiatives that we are very proud of and you've seen why in BJ's presentation is our Investing in Kentucky's Future initiative. This was an initiative that began in 2012. It was a six year, $3 million investment of the foundations. And um, our main objective really was not so much that we would transform a health issue, but we would build we would support the building of coalition capacity, and community capacity to address any health issue. So as BJ explained, um, we, we didn't provide just funding and we didn't ask for a request. Our request for proposals wasn't really for a grant application. It was actually for a business plan because the community had to invest in it. It had to be community driven. Um, it wasn't the foundation determining what health issue you were gonna address. It wasn't the foundation determining how you would address it. It was the interagency work of the coalitions. We wanted to only fund coalitions in the communities that would present a proposal around how to address one health issue. Um, Bounce chose, um, the Jefferson County chose ACES, our other coalitions, all of them, all of the others cho chose to address childhood obesity uh, prevention. So that's another line of work we're invested in. Um, but our, our funding went accompanied by anything that could strengthen capacity in local communities. So we provided training. We had two training, two four-day trainings a year. We provided coaching, mentoring. We provided evaluation consultants that which we, we brought from, um, from abroad. We really wanted to emphasize that these coalitions had to come up not just with how to address the 
the children's health issue with strategies, but also to work on policies in the community. And um, the outcome was, was fabulous. We had 38 local policies that were passed at the end of the, of the, of the initiative. Um, we had a one year funding planning just for planning and then five years for implementation. We also had a local cash match as a requirement. So it was really about community capacity building and, um, and it was very su successful. So we're very proud of it. The foundation focuses on four areas. We focus on access to healthcare. We focus on tobacco use reduction. We focus on children's health with an emphasis on ACEs because of our work with the Investing in Kentucky's Future Initiative. And we focus on obesity and diabetes prevention, mainly because these are the big issues that plague Kentucky. And we're trying to see if we can somehow make a dent in improving the health of Kentuckians. In terms of our ACEs work, we began with the Jefferson County Pilot Schools, and we realized that um, they were very successful in an urban setting. But given the context and the composition of Kentucky, we really felt it was important to see if we could replicate this successfully in a rural community. So the foundation then has founded what we call the Rural ACEs Project. And at, in that project, we didn't just want to fund a school intervention, we felt that we really should try to engage the public health departments and the community in the intervention. And so um, the Rural ACES Project funded the schools in Russell County, which is a, a county in, in Eastern Kentucky. And the three schools there, our initial project was just elementary. This one was elementary, middle and high school. And we worked with the Lake Cumberland District Health Department, which is a 10 county health department that also works with coalitions. So it was important to train the public health departments and there was a trained a trainer that was presented so that they could train the different coalitions within the region. Um, because of the success of, of both of our initiatives, both the urban and the rural projects, the, department, the Kentucky Department for Public Health reached out to the foundation for us to implement and expand this to different communities around the Commonwealth. This time with an emphasis on the uh, impact of the pandemic on the communities and on schools and on children in terms of trauma and as well as, well as in, because of the racial trauma issues that Kentucky experimented during those the, the, the times of the pandemic as well. So this is a project we're developing again with the Bounce Coalition and it will be in three areas in urban and rural um, um, schools and public health departments. Uh, aside from that, the foundation made a little bit of a shift from being a philanthropy to being a policy advocacy organization in 2016, where we're emphasizing more of our statewide policy work. We wanna get, you know, the demonstration projects have shown us where to focus and how to focus on issues, what's important to change, so the foundation has created or established or partnered to create um, what we call the Kentucky Coalition for Healthy Children. It is a statewide coalition. It has 35 member steering committee who have signed a memorandum of understanding that includes universities, health plans, advocacy organizations, state organizations, all interested in working and improving children's health in the school setting. We've chosen the school setting because our demonstration project showed us the importance of intervening in schools. Um, we are working on, with the, that coalition on statewide policy, ACEs is one of the, the focus areas. ACEs, as it relates to school, the school setting is something we're working on. Additionally, the foundation is coordinating with state agencies. From uh, public health, we worked on the strategic plan and the ACEs work. Uh, a new partnership has formed between the Cabinet for Family Services and Public Health. The foundation has been invited to participate in that and the ACEs to move the ACEs along in the state. And additionally, the foundation pitched the ACEs work, the importance of ACEs to a group of foundations and 30 signed on and uh, decided to, we've, resulting in the Bloom Initiative, which is also led by Kentucky Youth Advocates. And I'm sure Carly will mention that as well. Um, which is also looking to, to move statewide policies at the legislature that will impact um, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. And I know I went through that fast, but um, I do want to give Carly a, a, an opportunity to continue and expand on their work. Thanks, Amalia. Um, so yeah, as Amalia mentioned, um, uh, my name is Carly Mosby. 
Um, I am the Director of Strategic Initiatives at Kentucky Youth Advocates. Um, and so since 2020, we have served as the backbone organization to the Bounce Coalition and really just helped to project manage and staff the work. Um, and as Amalia mentioned, our partnership with the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky has really allowed us to continue moving our work out into the state um, very strategically and by, and by working with you know, other rural and urban um, school districts. So we've been able to expand our reach outside of the Louisville Jefferson County area to include 52 other counties in Kentucky. Um, our goal, of course, is to turn this map blue um, and really reach all the communities throughout the state and really just build, um, build a trauma-informed Kentucky community by community. Um, and we've also been able to, um, to leverage funding from multiple sources, including some additional uh, foundations. So, so since that um, pilot work and, and that initial funding from the Foundation for Healthy Kentucky, um, we've really been able to leverage um, some additional funding from, from foundations to really just continue this work into other sectors that serve kids and families. And we've also been able to adapt our work uh, to engage those that serve adult populations as well. Um, so, so these are some of the sectors that we either have previously or are currently working in. Um, and, you know, as an example, we're in our final year of a project um, that's funded by a local foundation here in Louisville um, to help uh, several local residential care facilities in, uh, in Louisville here to become trauma-informed organization and in particular um, assist them in establishing and maintaining their status as a qualified residential treatment facility under the Families, Families First Act. Um, and we've also had, we're all on our second round of funding um, from another local foundation to work with um, uh, youth serving organizations, uh, particularly um, out of school time providers here in Louisville, um, and really just assist them in becoming trauma informed organizations as well. Um, in addition to sort of our typical, uh, typical staff trainings, typical technical assistance that Bounce provides, um, we've also been able to provide these organizations with services um, related to parent engagement, um, and even social emotional learning for kids um, in this particular piece of work. So um, really some, some cool things coming out of that as well. So as far as where we hope to go in the future, um, we wanna continue helping to create you know, transformational change for the organizations and agencies that we work with. So we know, and we want to help uh, the agencies that we work with understand that trauma-informed care is not only about how agencies care for their clients, but also how they, they care for their staff. Um, and our goal is to really help organizations and agencies truly create a culture that is trauma-informed for everyone that interacts, um, interacts with that agency. Um, we also wanna uh, continue overlaying our diversity, equity, and inclusion work into um, the trauma-informed framework. So we've been working um, hard over the past few years to ensure you know, that we have a diverse group of trainers on our bench of trainers um, that we, you know, we've also created um, or we've updated our current curriculum um, and created additional curriculum to ensure that we're addressing race-based trauma um, and other issues of equity um, in, into our trauma-informed framework. Um, we would really like to get into um, the justice and court system. So we would love to further engage so either at the local and or state level um, to create trauma-informed court systems and you know, trauma-informed justice systems as well. Um, and finally, we would just wanna continue growing um, our family and parent engagement. That's such a critical piece as, as BJ mentioned. And this is really an area that we're kind of continuing to grow in some really neat ways. Um, so we're just really excited to see um, kind of how that plays out. So um, these are just some of the ways that you can get in touch with us. Um, we're happy to answer any questions that may have appeared in the um, Q&A. We can um, check that out as soon as we get off here. Um, but we just so appreciate having the opportunity to share with such a great group of panelists and advocates that are so passionate about, passionate about this important topic. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you all, that was just spectacular.
Um, it's just so great to know what's going on in Kentucky and how much uh, of the groundwork that you've laid for all of this. So uh, it just really was uh, the perfect accompaniment to the other presentations to know more about balance and we'll be definitely keeping in touch with you about it. Thank you, thank you all. Dan Press, who is the founder of CTIP and general counsel, go ahead. Thank you, one of, one of 25 founders uh, of CTIP. And, uh, but I, I just am so impressed by the presentations we've had today. Thank you all. Um, in each of our workshops, we have somebody with lived experience who tells their story. And uh, our presenter today is somebody I've known for five or six years now. Um, about five or six years ago, my law firm was approached asking if we could help a woman put together a nonprofit organization to help women who had been trafficked, women who had suffer, uh, were suffering from substance abuse disorder, just as she had. Uh, and she wanted to, she had recovered and she wanted to help uh, people like her recovered. So we helped to create a 501c3 organization. She started with nothing but a, a vision and, and very intense determination. And today she's running a program with a budget of almost a million and a half dollars in both Baltimore and DC, helping many, many women who had gone through what she had gone through. Uh, it's just an incredible success story of a woman who took her own trauma and turned it into a positive force, not only for herself, but for many in her community. So I'm really, really honored to introduce uh, Natasha Gaines uh, to tell us her story and how she's raised money from foundations uh, to fund her, her program. Thank you. Thank Natasha. You. Thank you, Dan, for the introduction. Hey, everybody, I'm Natasha Quines, the founder and president of Her Resiliency Center. I think I have about 10 minutes to talk here, so I may go a little fast. It's, um, I founded Her Resiliency Center in May 2015, and we opened in February 2016. And in um, doing this, I had to get really comfortable with my own story and my own experiences that I had kept hidden for so many years. And what that looks like, and I'll connect it back to the women we serve, is that I grew up in a home with a drug addict father and uh, uh, who beat us and we lived well below the poverty line and a teenage mom who left us. And the I now know all these years later with her resiliency center and what we see with the women we serve is that the trauma, and we know this everybody on this call, I'm sure the trauma impacts the brain's development and the defiance that comes. And because of that, you know, um, I, I would lie or fight just because I could or needed to. That was the way I was operating in the world. And at 20 years old, I packed a bag and moved to Washington, D.C. My parents said, never call us again. I was like, F you, I can do a lot better. And while they weren't great parents, I wasn't prepared for the beast of D.C. on my own, much like the women we serve at her resiliency center, which I'll share about in just a moment. Um, and I end up selling my body as a way to get by and make money. Um, I picked up a crack pipe and alcohol as a way to cope. And within a year, I was living in a homeless shelter. Fortunately for me, 20 years ago, I got clean from drugs and alcohol and Alcoholics Anonymous. And my community raised me. And I say that because when I started Her Resiliency Center in May 2015, I had just taken what I had learned from Alcoholics Anonymous at that point, the peer-based relationships without a hierarchy to sit with each other to create true empowerment so that other women can have access to the type of opportunities that I did through that uh, through attending 12-step recovery. At Her Resiliency Center, we um, serve young women 18 to 25, overcoming various forms of hardship. We don't ask that there are any other like identifiers. A lot of organizations around the country ask that she's already sexually exploited. She's already homeless. She's already addict, uh, um, uh, in, the, in the throes of addiction or young mother. And for us at her, we don't want her to have to fall further through the cracks to be able to provide the, her support because we know the quicker that she can get on the path on the path of recovery for herself of whatever that looks like, she has the opportunity to get on the path to self-sufficiency and a thriving future and giving back in the way that she sees it herself as well. We don't put stipulations like you have to do it this way. 
the women we serve are human beings. We're all human beings and we deserve to be treated as individuals. We, um, the, uh, some of the stuff that we talk about at HER is that, uh, and the way I frame things with foundations. So we're not really, we weren't really eligible for foundations until we hit the five year mark of operations. And in that, right after we hit it, we got our first, um, K Fritz Foundation grant, which we've since been able to get renewed. And in doing this, we talk, we really talk about the human experience and being human beings. Um, and, and at Her Resiliency Center, we don't have case managers because the women we serve are cases to manage, they're humans. And so I can't then assign them a case manager. One of the things that I've learned though, and it was a bad, it was a hard learning lesson is that through writing proposals to foundations, through, through um, writing um, proposals to government agencies, we have to help educate the reader. Um, I saw the question just come up, what do we call those we serve? We call them peers. And the reason we call them peers is that we're all on a peer level with each other, other than uh, uh, the hierarchy that flows for um, you know, a flow chart for a funder. Our titles are irrelevant. Oftentimes the women we serve know what's best for them. Trauma survivors often know what's best for them. And trauma being a trauma survivor, you're often told you don't know what's best for you. There's a difference between knowing what's best for you and knowing how to access it. And that's what we help with at HER a lot of times. And so, um, but going back to this funders, like I didn't use the word victim enough times in a funding in a funding uh, request. And I didn't get, I didn't get the, um, the money. And it was really painful when I learned that is why I didn't get it. But as like, we had to tell the, um, the person that, you know, the director of that funding opportunity is, we don't talk about the women we serve in behind their back in a way we wouldn't talk about them to their face. And what that means is we don't call them victims because all, people who often have a victim mentality don't ever really get to find the ownership of their lives. And the women we serve, they're resilient and they're strong and we do not wanna take their power away from them ever. Um, the, as it relates to the applications, I made some notes because that is what uh, I know Dan and Jesse wanted me to speak to is how we are able to get funding from foundations. We use stories a lot. We connect those stories in those education opportunities for the re reader. A lot of times the reader is gonna be interested. They're gonna love to learn about trauma. They're gonna think that they know everything about trauma and they know a lot, I'm sure, but it's really important to show the examples when this happens, then this happens and this happens. And a lot of times we use vignettes, current vignettes, so that we can create a description of what she is experiencing on a daily basis and how, how we help with the different connection to systems and how we see it. We still use data because um, I learned early on that you have to speak to the head and the heart when you're asking for money. Some people like data, some people like stories, but when you put the two together, you have magic. Um, so I think, um, so the education piece, I think one of the other things is the, the ability to show how we're tracking long-term outcomes of those we serve. And something we really emphasize is life isn't an upward trajectory. There's gonna be things that you go backwards to go forwards and at her, we're not about checking boxes. We're about actually helping her get to her outcome as she just sees it in her life. And our model is 24 months to which at the 18th month, we tell the women we serve that no one ever graduates from her resiliency center. And that is a lot of that model was based off of the mindset of how many women we serve went through foster care and at 18 months we're told okay we're, we can't help you anymore we can't talk to you anymore or at 18 years and um and in aa where i got uh, clean and sober your role changes as you get more time and to keep showing up to the for the newcomer to see that long-term sobriety or clean time can happen and so with that the women at 18 months are told they no one ever graduates, but rather at the 24 month mark, their role within the organization is to evolve. And they can be advocates or um, 
depending on where they are in their trajectory, mentors for other young women, because we all want to have purpose. And when you can give back, you have a sense of empowerment and power, as long as you, and, and, and providing them the tools, they actually can be really effective in their life and in someone else's life as well. Um, and so that's a lot of uh, what we really emphasize is the human element um, and building those relationships, sharing stories. I share stories with my grant people all the time because that allows them to know one, we're in it, what we're seeing and also where like the gaps may fall. So, cause you always have the opportunity to help um, inform where maybe more funding should um, go in the future. The last thing I'll share is that through my own journey at HER, because um, again, I'm a peer as well. I'm on a journey just like the other women we serve. Um, and starting the organization, like Dan said, uh, the firm, Vanessa Feldman, was very helpful to us. And I had to, you know, and, and after I gave my C3 and go ask for, I could go ask for money. And in doing this, I had to get comfortable with my story. I used the, the bad stuff, the sensational stuff, whatever it was to one, get donors to give me money that I understand. Um, two is also to get buy-in from the women we serve so that they would trust that, hey, our situations may not be the same, but the feelings and the desperation of some, needing something different are similar in nature. And now my job is to help the women we serve get to whatever room they want to be in. And I was telling Dan and Jesse this yesterday is that um, I often navigate a lot of bureaucratic settings, settings that women like me don't often make it to. And sometimes I rub people the wrong way. And But the reality is, is that a lot of bureaucratic settings aren't prepared for the scrappiness of a survivor. They're not used to someone who's like, this is real and this needs, and, and, and it's life and death and it's urgent in, in nature. And so the more tools I am able to get myself, I'm able to share them with the women. Like I do EMDR therapy twice a week. I still go to AA meetings, whatever works, I will share with others so that they have that opportunity to have it too. And in doing this, I've learned that my job isn't just to share the sensational stuff, but to show the resilience that can come so that I can and also help remove whatever barriers during my time so that she doesn't have to go work through them later. Thank you. Natasha, thank you. Uh, I hope that you read through the chat and feel the love. One person said screaming for the people in the back. Um, <laughs> which in a Zoom room, I just, I thought that that was great. But the the, the personal nature, I mean, I, I think of one of the things that I'm struck by is not just the success that you've had, the, the, the change that you've been able to make in others, but how personal this is for you and how it continues to be an ongoing journey, the work that you do for others. And we wish you the best and continued success for others. Thank you for sharing Thank you. Um, your experience and your work. And, and giving some insight for how others um, may be able to turn their lived experiences and passions into projects that help promote trauma-informed, resilience-focused, and healing-centered work in our world. There cannot possibly be enough of it. Denny, before I go on and start to close, do you, do you have any other words that you want to share? No, I just, um, I, your resolve, not just your resilience, but your resolve to make a difference is just so remarkable and, and does need to be shouted from the rooftop so that others can mirror you and learn from you. Um, and I hope that through this, we can get to a point where we're not, we're not responding to the trauma, but actually preventing it in the first place. And that's where systems change and policy change come in so that we don't you know, have more of this that we need to react to. But I just, I can't thank you enough for being here with us. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Like Denny said, we're working toward prevention. We're working toward upstream approaches and truly systems change. And like I was saying at the beginning, we need all of you. While I may be sitting in DC, my background comes from community work. It wasn't long ago that I was working on the lowering overdose and violence epidemics or love initiative at the community center where I was a director of development in charge of fundraising. I know that a lot of this work is done by so many of us on a volunteer basis, and that is admirable. 
<laughs> I was a volunteer for five years and I, I totally understand it. Again, this is a passion project, but to scale, we need to be able to start to support this work in a different way at different levels. And so we think that this uh, session on foundations was so important and hope that you got a lot of information from it. We know that there is more conversation that needs to be had. And so I am putting in the chat again, the link to our breakout sessions, which will begin as soon as we are off this call. If you can't get it from the chat, please go to the National Prevention Science Coalition to Improve Lives website and make sure that you are able to join us if you would like to. Um, thank you for everybody who stuck around this whole time. Thank you for everybody who presented the wonderful foundations and Natasha and Tony for what they shared. Denny, thank you for always being the hostess with the mostest for all of us and starting us off with some groovy music. We look forward to seeing everybody again in two weeks for the how to for community coalitions session on April 1st, same time, 1 to 4 p.m. Eastern. We look forward to seeing you all then. Feel free to reach out in the meantime if you have any questions, comments, or concerns.